I'm facing a flag. I hope you can too. I yep. pledge allegiance to the flag, the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic, which it stands and one, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. We we'll have a moment of silence for all our military personnel out there protecting us and for everybody that's going through suffering because of the COVID virus. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'll do a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Persinger. Present. Commissioner Jasinski. Here. Commissioner Bauer. Present. Commissioner Stevens. Present. Thank you. It's interesting who those who stay here and those who stay present. This is Mayor Dale Cook. I'm also present. I'm not physically here, mentally, but uh, or mentally here, but I am here. We also have on board our town manager, Mr. Zolper, and our town attorney, Mr. Fred Townsend. Thank you all for coming. Um, with the adoption of the agenda, just a very short explanation from myself, and then uh, I'll ask for an adoption of the agenda. Um, if you need further explanation, I'll have the town manager explain to you, but uh, we were unable to get the numbers of companies on board to explain everything today about item number two, which is the discussion possibly vote to approve hiring of a company. Um, so I would like to accept a motion to accept the, accept the agenda as it is, except for an amendment to item number two and make item number two a discuss item only, not discuss and vote. Okay, so moved. Who's that by? Uh, Commissioner Persinger. Moved by Commissioner Persinger. Is there a second for that? Second. Second by Commissioner Jasinski. Thank you very much. There's a proper motion to second to accept the agenda with the amendment to make item number two discuss only and not a discuss and vote. Is there any further discussion? All right, since there is none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any against, say nay. Any abstentions, it's unanimous. So we've adopted the agenda. Ashley, is there anybody in for public comment? Um, it looks like there are three right now. The, um, the first one is Karen White. Go ahead. And she is part of the um, consultants. Oh, okay. I'll put it. That's right, okay. Um, so then we have Sean Thompson, is he? I have, I know that Lenny Mazzotti, Josh Johnson, and then Karen White, and then I have, it says Sean Thompson, and then there's just an Allen. Um, I'll bring each of them in and we can see, and I can ask them to wait if not. And then if they are part of the consultants, then we'll just move them to that. Mr. Thompson, are you here for uh, to comment on the on the meeting in general, or for are you with a specific company? With a specific company, I was invited here. I work for CTC Technology. Very good. Then we're going to put you on hold for a while until we get to that item, if it's all right with you. Absolutely. Thank you. And then I'm going to bring in. It says Alan. Oh, Mr. Winton. Yes, hello there. How are you? It's public comment time. If you give your full name and your location in Dewey, we appreciate you being here. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today, Dale. Uh, my name is Alan Winton. I am a permanent resident of uh, Four Sweet Street, number seven, and uh, here in lovely Dewey Beach. And uh, <laughs> I just got let into the meeting. So is it time for me to make a comment? Yes. yes, it's public comment time. Just so you know that we, when we voted on the agenda, we voted to make item number two a discuss item only, not a discuss and vote. And that's the possibility of bringing on a, uh, a advisory company about 5G polls. 
All right, so uh, I cannot use this opportunity to re reiterate my displeasure with the fact that we're putting up these polluting, visually polluting towers on our beachfronts. Oh, no, you can make any comment you want to for three minutes, sir. Okay, uh, I uh, uh, was out, uh, I'm standing, sitting on my front deck looking, enjoying my view of the ocean uh, just yesterday and some gentlemen pulled up in a Dewey Beach pickup truck and took out tape measures and started wandering around. So out of just curiosity, I went down and had a chat with them and I uh, asked them if they were what they were measuring for the 5G poles. And he said, yeah, I said, well, uh, do, is there a location plan to place one here on the street? And they said, yeah, we think it's where that orange flag is over there. So directly across the street from me and about uh, 17 feet from the center of the beach walk uh, on the dune behind a bench that uh, is, is sitting there is a flag which um, I am imagining is going to be a, a 35 foot pole with a bunch of hardware on it and wires running down and and uh, it looks like it's going to be right in front of the beachcombers uh, property so that when they look sit out on their decks they'll be staring right at it and it's also going to be blocking the view of several other people on my beach also it's ugly it's going to be ugly and it's going to uh, pollute the seascape I know the town spent some money not too long ago to put up these bulletin board type affairs and get all these miscellaneous signs that were cluttering up the beach entrances off the beach. And I thought that was a real good move. I thought that was a good step in the right direction. And I thought it did a lot to enhance uh, the natural beauty of our seascape when enjoyed both from the beach and from individuals living near the beach from their homes. And uh, by putting that pole up there, we will uh, degrade the view of the beach degrade property values for those affected by the pole blocking their view of the beach. And uh, generally uh, it's, it's the beginning, it's, it's just another step and having something rammed down our throats and then if you don't like it too bad, you're paying for it. And so I just wanna express my extreme displeasure over the continuation of this and I will continue to uh, fight whatever I can about it. Is that my time? No, no, you've got, you've got a, another right. minute to go. All right, so, uh, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to have, when they start digging holes, where I'm going to have to take a chair out there and put it on top of the flag and sit there and refuse to leave until I'm arrested and thrown in jail. But I'm, I'm retired. I don't really care. And if I have to call the uh, WBOC, the radio stations, the TV stations, the, the Cape Gazette, the News Journal, and get them here to, to uh, interview me and film me as I'm being dragged away in handcuffs, so be it. Uh, I'm angry about this, and I'm really uh, fed up that uh, a outside government agency can come in here and tell us how to louse up our lovely beach. That's about all I have to say, Dale. Thanks for your allowing me the time to speak with everybody. Well, Thank I have to tell you, we certainly appreciate you being here. No. Thank you no, very no. much. Thank you, Alan. Ashley, is there anybody else in the? That is everyone from the public. Everyone else who is on there is here to do a presentation. Okay, and we can now have public comment. Well, if everybody, if we'll move on to action and discussion item, <laughs> item number one, discuss and possibly vote to authorize the Center for Inland Bays to proceed with a National Coastal Resilience Grant application for Sunset Park and the surrounding area with the understanding that the town of Dewey Beach will have a $50,000 cash match requirement for the project start of early calendar year 2022 if the grant application is successful. And just so that you all know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is almost the same application we put in last year and uh, or not exactly the same, the same type of application we put in last year when we approved the $50,000 matching grant and it wasn't called for because the application did not get accepted. Today we have with us Marianne Walsh from the Center for the Inland Bay who brought this back up to us and, and helped do it quite a bit. We really appreciate it, Marianne, mm -hmm. if you would uh, um, start your presentation. Okay, um, Ashley, do you want to do it or do you want me to share? Um, either one, Bill Stevens has it or? Well, if Marion has it, she can do it. That's, okay. Uh, be I'll, easy go, I'll go ahead and try to share my screen then. <clears throat> Marion, we appreciate your help on this one. Oh, you're very welcome. I appreciate you um, putting me on your schedule today. 
Okay, um, we'll get this back to the, hang on just a second. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, so um, thanks for putting me on your schedule today. This is essentially the same uh, grant program and proposal that we submitted last summer to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's very typical for these larger federal, gr federal grants to have to submit several times before you finally get chosen. Um, these are very highly competitive programs. They're national programs. And um, we felt like we had a really good proposal for Sunset Park and some of the other areas of the Dewey Bayfront last year. And we got pretty good reviews from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. But there were a few comments that they gave us that, uh, with suggestions for improvement, some things that they were looking for that um, they felt like we didn't quite hit the mark on. So uh, we feel like it's uh, sort of a no-brainer to resubmit this time if the town is still committed to this. Uh, we have discussed internally how to address the comments that we got the last mm -hmm. time. And um, it's not going to take a lot of work on our part because we already have most of it done already. We just have to make a few revisions and, and um, do an update to the budget and make sure that all the partners that we had in line last time are still on board. <clears throat> so uh, just as a reminder for any of you who were not um, on the council last year or um, um, for Bill, for you, since you're new to this, um, we have completed two major projects uh, that were managed by the Center for the Inland Bays and done in partnership with the town. So uh, one of them that was completed uh, a little over a year ago was the Reed Avenue Living Shoreline. And uh, we feel like that's been a very successful project. We had um, a lot of um, commitment from DelDOT on that and uh, we got a, a nice grant from the state. Town contributed some cash match for that project as well. And um, we have seen reduction in some of the chronic flooding issues that have occurred on Reed Avenue. Uh, we've had um, very good success with the restoration of the tidal wetlands there. Um, and we have an oyster reef included in it. Uh, we have like a kayak launch there. It, um, to my eye, it seems like a very um, nice project in terms of the aesthetics of the area. And uh, my understanding from talking to Phil Winkler and some of the other residents along Reed Avenue is that they're very pleased with how it's been performing so far. Definitely. So the second project, which was completed um, last spring and summer was the bioretention facility at the corner of Reed Ave and um, Coastal Highway, right in front of the little store. So again, we got a state grant for that project and the town contributed $25,000 in cash match. And DelDOT um, was a, an enormously helpful partner in this one. They actually took on the um, job of constructing it as part of the sidewalk and, um, and re, uh, pavement rehab work that they were doing along Coastal Highway at the time. Um, so they put a lot of their resources into it. And um, so that project has been completed. So the Sunset Park project would be the third major project that we do with the town. <clears throat> so we've um, tried previously to uh, do several grant proposals on this. It's a fairly expensive project. So the regular state grants that we have so much success with typically just won't quite cover uh, the cost of this project. Um, so we started looking at some of these um, bigger national and um, national grant programs and loan programs and so forth. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has a National Coastal Resiliency Fund program that they run every year. That's the one that we submitted to. And um, they break up the, um, the types of things that you can submit to into various categories. So you can submit for concept design development and site evaluation. Well, we've already done that part for Sunset Park. Um, you can submit then for uh, final design and permitting, or you can submit for implementation, but you can't cross those categories. Um, so we submitted last year to complete the final design and engineering and the permitting applications, um, not just for the Sunset Park, 
um, which is this area, and we, we have a living shoreline proposed for that area, but also if we're um, going to be able to get some bigger money to do design and permitting, we wanted to take a look at this entire area between Dagsworthy and McKinley to see if there are some stormwater uh, improvements that we can do that can be integrated in with the shoreline. Um, so the idea would be that this project would help, present, help prevent some of the chronic flooding that's occurring on Dagsworthy and um, help uh, uh, prevent and uh, restore some of the, prevent erosion and restore some of the missing shoreline that has been lost to erosion. Um, Dagsworthy, if you are familiar with that road, pretty much just drops off into Rehoboth Bay because of the erosion. And um, we're currently losing uh, a foot or two of macadam still per year there. Uh, we've done some analyses. Typically, since 2005, there's been a one to two foot loss in shoreline in this whole area um, each year. Um, so um, we've lost a lot of habitat. We're losing infrastructure and the um, integrity of existing in infrastructure is being threatened. And um, Sunset Park is just an amenity that the town could really um, improve so that you would get a lot more use of it by residents and by visitors. <clears throat> so um, just uh, as a review of how this project developed, um, this project is included in your stormwater master plan that we developed back in 2016. And um, Sunset Park Living Shoreline was also a priority project in a living shoreline siting and concept design plan that we did um, back in 2015 and 2016. So uh, we've submitted a couple of proposals. One was a loan uh, application to the state, which we were not selected for. That was a, a, a one-time loan program that the state was offering with principal forgiven. Um, but our project was not selected. And then we did the proposal last year to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, our plan is to resubmit in 2021 um, with your concurrence. Um, a two-page pre-proposal is due on April 7th. So that's um, next week. Um, we already have a draft of that developed. We don't have to provide a lot of detail in that two pager, but we do have to provide an estimated budget and um, who our partners would be and, and where we would be getting the required cash match. And then um, they, those pre-proposals are reviewed by mm -hmm. NIFWIF. And um, if they like our pre-proposal, then they invite us to submit a full proposal. And that, that full proposal would be due on June 23rd. Um, just a, a review of what we proposed last year. Uh, on the right-hand side here is what we are calling the phase one implementation area, which is what we've already done. We've done the living shoreline here at Monagle Park. We've done the bioretention facility up at the uh, more Northern end of Reed Avenue. And the proposed area for concentration in this grant proposal would be the square on the left. So basically the area from the um, Bay Resort Hotel along the shoreline around um, North Beach and over to the Lions Club Marsh. And then looking also at some of the stormwater infrastructure a block or two in. <clears throat> we do have a concept design for this already and it involves a restoration of tidal wetlands which are the polka dot areas here living shoreline structures, including an offshore wave attenuation device reef, um, shell bags and, um, and other types of structures to stabilize the, um, the edge of the shoreline, some backfill with, with sand. And uh, we would also be improving some of the plantings and, and um, amenities in Sunset Park. The outfall for the, re for the Dagsworthy drainage area comes out here at the northern end of um, Sunset Park, right about where the kayak concession is. And there's been a fair amount of erosion there and we feel like uh, we can benefit from some retrofit of that outfall stabilization of that little channel there with some nature-based features. And we also have the opportunity to, um, uh, to implement some um, uh, pervious parking areas, some replacement of pavement that's not really necessary. And we've been in discussions with Delvat about that. 
Um, so we'd be looking at this whole area for opportunities for improvements. Uh, the Lions Club Marsh has some um, drainage issues that could be uh, corrected. We would stabilize the shoreline, do some improvements of the hydrology and drainage in that wetland. And then there's also an opportunity if the town so desires to do some uh, pedestrian walkways, boardwalks and so forth along this area. So we would um, be working with the town and with the business owners and residents in the area to try to figure out what the best options are for that. So at the end of this, we would come out with final engineering designs for all of the cost estimates um, and implementation plan and um, permit applications for anything that we need permits from the state and the Army Corps for. Um, so we feel like this is very important. It's the continued implementation of the stormwater master plan for the town. Um, this would provide the design and permitting ap applications for most of the publicly owned bayfront in, in Dewey Beach. Um, the intention is to reduce flooding and provide resilience to sea level rise and to the storms that are becoming more frequent and more intense. We would stabilize about 800 to 1,000 feet of eroded shoreline with uh, nature-based features, living shoreline structures and hybrid structures. Uh, we would provide designs for some upgrade of aging and undersized stormwater infrastructure in those blocks, um, provide enhanced protection of homes and businesses in that area of this town. Um, we would also be providing a lot of habitat uplift through restoration of tidal wetlands and improved offshore and um, subtitle habitat for fish and crabs and birds and so forth. And then um, we hope to provide some enhanced safety and aesthetics and recreation opportunities uh, at Sunset Park and, and the Lions Club Marsh area. Um, we, would hope that we could include a small boat launch that would be stabilized uh, at the end of Dagsworthy and um, provide a much safer and um, easier way for people to launch small sailboats, kayaks, and so forth. And then um, a big part of our mission at the Center for the Inland Bays is to provide public education and outreach, not just about the Inland Bays, um, but also about the benefits of the types of green infrastructure projects that the center and the town are investing in together. So this is a, a reminder of the rough budget for the project. We, uh, this may need to be tweaked a little bit with updated numbers from our consultants. But um, last year when we submitted this, our total estimated project cost was a little over $150,000. We were requesting $82,000 in the grant and um, the town had committed at that time $50,000 in cash match. We also can include um, in-kind match, so town staff salaries, um, any of Bill's time that gets put into this project um, would count as in-kind match. And um, both uh, Senator Lopez and Representative Schwartzkopf uh, had committed $10,000 each from um, community transportation funds for the project. Um, Deldat also committed some in-kind staff time and any time that uh, comes from volunteers that from um, volunteers working with the town or with the center on the planning and development of the project gets counted as match as well. So the project would start, uh, if we were successful, we would be notified next November, I believe. And uh, the project money would be available later in the winter of 2022. And we would anticipate that it takes about a year to develop all of these plans and permitting. So that is what I have, and I am very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Commissioners, or any of you that Mr. Stevens got your hand up? Yes, Dr. Walsh, uh, a quick question for you. Uh, who's ultimately responsible for the cost at 155 if those estimates are lower than the actual? Um, well, we would up the grant request. We have to have a one-to-one -one, um, match in, in funding for the grant that can be cash or in kind. It has to be non-federal. Okay. Um, uh, but if the cost comes out a little bit more expensive this year, uh, which I expect it might because of increases in um, salaries and so forth. And um, the other thing that we need to include this year is to address 
the comments of the reviewers, one of their um, requests was if we resubmit, they want an adapted management plan. So how would we do monitoring the project? If something goes wrong, how do we deal with that and how do we fix it? Um, so that would take a little bit more of our consultant time to develop that, um, that adaptive management plan. So the cost probably will be slightly more, but um, we have plenty of match for it, I believe. Uh, it's not gonna be a lot more. And we would just up the, the grant request a little bit. And Dr. Waltz, do you remember how much the McGonagall Park renovation costs? Um, I don't have that number at the tip of my tongue. Um, it, was, it was something on the order of $140,000. Um, but that was a little bit more expensive because we had to go through, um, uh, Del Dot had developed some of the planning and permitting documents. So we had to go through some extra engineering exercises to make sure that these plans complied with the state uh, Del Dot regulations and their requirements for plan sets. And um, uh, we ended up putting in some additional tide gates that weren't in the original plan. So I think it was something on the order of $140,000 for everything. And Del Dot uh, contributed quite a lot to that cost. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Walsh, uh, could you do me a favor and take down the, uh, yes. the display so I can see everybody on the computer? <laughs> uh, okay, there's the stop share button. Sorry That's terrific. That. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that. I just, uh, what, what uh, comment that I'm sure we all believe or we all want to make or ask is, what makes you feel that this is probably a better plan this year than it was before and might get accepted this time, unlike before? Well, actually, we got very few um, uh, comments back as to things that they felt were missing. There was the adaptive management plan that they were looking for, and um, they, they wanted us to ad address uh, in more detail how we expected the project to reduce flooding in the area. They, they said what we submitted didn't necessarily convince them that the design that we come up with would significantly deter flooding. And um, we know that it will, but we just didn't do a good enough job of providing that detail in the proposal. Um, so I have met with the consulting firms and um, they feel very confident that we can address those um, comments. It's still going to be a competitive program. A lot of people throughout the country submit for this. But um, as, as I said, it's typical that you have to do multiple submissions to these types of programs before you get funded. Right. And, um, you know, I, I just feel like it, there's not much work to resubmit this because we did so much work last year on it. Right. And um, I think with just a little bit more work together, we can have a good proposal that I think has a decent chance of getting funded. It's definitely not guaranteed, but... Um, it's worth a try. And Commissioner, just so you know, uh, just a comment that I'll make, this is asking for a commitment from the town to make available $50,000 if the program gets accepted or if the project gets accepted. It does not limit the town where we can take that $50,000 out of the budget. We would later on then decide that. And uh, so most likely I would guess it would come from infrastructure, but that would be decided at a later time. And, and the money would not have to be available until early next spring, so a year from now. Right. So any other questions from the commissioners? I have Mr. Persinger, then Mr. Jasinski. Yeah, this project, if it's approved, uh, would result just in uh, a design for how you would actually do the work. That's correct. Uh, and any idea of how much the actual project might cost if we were to try to go out and seek some money to, uh, to actually do the work? Yeah, well, it's going to provide a design for a very large area, uh, the whole block, be, uh, um, the couple of blocks between the Bay Resort Hotel and um, McKinley and a block or two uh, from the Bayfront. Uh, so it would include stormwater retrofits as well as living shoreline and wetland uh, restoration designs. My uh, expectation is that uh, we could piecemeal those in terms of implementation. I don't know, I have no idea what the entire cost for implementation would be. Um, we had estimated previously that if we just did a living shoreline right at 
Sunset Park. I think the cost of that would be about $200,000 $200, or so uh, to implement. But I think that at that time, that also included some design costs. So the implementation costs will be reduced a little bit because we'll already have the design and permitting done. Um, but we'll have co separate cost estimates for each component of that. And we can peel them off as funding becomes available or grant opportunities become available. Mr. Persinger, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. Just one other question. We, we had talked some time ago, and I think the, uh, the infrastructure committee may have talked about this just recently about the uh, uh, stormwater uh, system that I think maybe in this particular area, was this some of the work that was discussed or was there work discussed in the same area on that, those same streets in terms of cleaning out or better supporting those stormwater drainage pipes? Yeah. I'm talking about the store. I'm talking about the, uh, the the mapping project that we went through. Yeah, but you're saying what's it? What part of that well, in this it, area? Yeah, is it in the same area on the same street? Because there was uh, Dr. Walsh just mentioned that there would be some recommendations with respect to stormwater management, and I'm just not sure how the two projects might dovetail, if at all. Uh, well, I would ask maybe, maybe Mr. Didi's. Do, do you remember? I don't remember off the top of my head, Mr. Didi's, but do you remember? Um, would the stormwater management pr uh, program, the, the drain, stormwater drain, was that part of this same area? Your mic. There might, there might be a slight overlap. If you give me a minute, I'll look at the maps. I'll pull them up. Well, any stormwater system mapping uh, that has been done would be very helpful for design. That would certainly cut some of the time required for design. Okay. That, that's Jim, all while you're, Jim, while you're looking that up, yeah. maybe we'll ask Mr. Jasinski his question. Maybe we could deal with that while, while you're looking that up. Yeah, um, just specifically around the northern boundary of the project area near the intersection of Baird and Bellevue. You were talking about, you know, improving access. Are you looking at potentially pedestrian access towards that area from that intersection? That's kind of um, where a lot of our stormwater management is in the area. So you're talking about around the hotel there? The north end of the hotel, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we uh, had worked with the town previously on what they would <laughs> like to see in this uh, concept design. And it was um, expressed to us that really like to have pedestrian access from Sunset Park to the northern end of the hotel. Right. Um, to to those streets there, so that would be included in the design. Okay, is that what you were asking? Yes, specifically. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and we've also the, we also had a letter of support from the owner of the hotel for this uh, proposal as well. Okay, Jim, did you were you able to? I'm still looking it up, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from any other commissioners at this time? Well, then. Um... Uh, Mr. Bauer, you had your hand up. Is it appropriate to make a motion at this point? Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to suggest something. If you look on your action and discussion items, it, if you were to if you were to remove uh, on number one, remove discuss and possibly vote to move to authorize and read the rest of that, that would that would make a great uh, uh, motion. All right, let's see here. Let me. No, item number one. Uh, item number one. Right. If you, if you would remove discuss and possibly vote and change it to move to authorize and read from there on, it would make okay. a great motion. All right. Uh, move to authorize the Center for Inland Bays to proceed with the National Coastline Resiliency Grant application for Sunset Park and the surrounding area with the understanding of the town of Dewey Beach will have a $50,000 cash match requirement for the project start of early calendar year 2022 if the grant application is successful. Mr. Stevens? Second. It's probably moved by Mr. Bauer and seconded by Mr. Stevens. Is there any further discussion on the item? Mr. Uh, Didi? I did locate the uh, the stormwater management plan that we have over here deals with uh, McKinley Street, takes it down to the uh, Bay Area, and 
it's in a gray area, which means it's totally uh, obstructed. That's the closest I've got. And the next closest street would be uh, Bellevue. Thank you, Mr. Deedes. We appreciate that. Is there any further discussion? Well, McKinley would definitely be included in this project. So right. that, that information would be helpful. Very good. Okay, I'll, I'll call the roll. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any against, say nay. Any abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Dr. Walsh, thank you very much. We'll we'll be thank you. We're going to be in close contact with you. Believe me. Okay. Yes, I'll definitely be in touch with you and Bill. You and you and and Ashley and Bill Zoper will see a lot of each other. About this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, gentlemen. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you. you. All right. We'll go on to item number two, which this is now only a discuss item. And it's uh, so in effect, it is, I won't read it out because there's a bit of a change there, but in effect, instead of just, instead of just approving hiring, I, voting to approve the hiring, we'll be voting, we'll be discussing hiring of a company instead of a particular company. So, um, Mr. Zolberg, did you want to start the conversation off with uh, your comments on this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so in an effort to consider as many different companies as possible. Mr. Zoper, we're getting a lot of interference every time you speak on your mic. Yeah, this, this happened before, Bill. You might want to disconnect and rejoin or something. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, I really would like to wait till he rejoins to start mm -hmm. the discussion. It might solve a bunch of your questions. Um, we, we don't want to discuss just one company in particular. We want to discuss number one, hiring a company and then a number of different companies. Can you hear me better now, Mayor? Absolutely, sir. Go right ahead now. Yeah, so thanks. In an effort to try to consider as many different companies as possible, I looked at three different companies, one of them being, of course, JMT, who we've had the most experience with because of Dell Dot. Another one was called HR Green. Um, I saw a presentation by them with the mayor when we were down at Fenwick Island last week on 5G poles and some of the, some of the, the challenges that some towns are having with, uh, with the 5G in certain areas of the country. And then the last one was CTC. Um, HR Green had to drop out um, earlier uh, this week um, because they weren't able to get licensed in Delaware to, in time to maybe do the workforce and consulting with us. So right now, um, for today, it's uh, JMT and CTC. And again, what we're looking for here is their expertise in 5G poll permitting, a process for the permitting, uh, retainer to help us uh, with, the, with the poll companies to, to get funding when, um, to help pay for our consultants, um, expertise in the RF or the radiation or the NIR, that's the N-I-E-R, uh, that's actually put off, uh, they say, by the 5G polls. All those types of things, we really need the expertise uh, here in town. So I would ask that um, I know some of the um, commissioners had went ahead and got some questions ready. I would ask that we have a good discussion with both these um, two consulting firms, not make a decision today, but ask some good questions, and then I'll try to get some additional consulting uh, firms in the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I, I want to first say that after I've learned a lot in this process. I've, been very frustrated through the 5G process, as most of you have been. As a matter of fact, all of you have expressed a lot of frustration over this. Uh, the way it was done in general, and the way the way it's been handled, uh, we need to we need more expertise in the matter. And we as volunteers don't have that expertise. No matter what we'd like to say or do, or, or possibly understand, it's way over our pay scale. Of course, there's a lot of things over our pay scale as commissioners, but uh, I, I think we need to have a little bit of discussion about what we think we might hire a company for. What, what, what do we want in a company? And uh, I would ask, do any of you have any questions about that or comments you wanna make before we bring the, co the companies on board here? Mr. Bauer. Yeah, is there anybody in the waiting room for public comment on yeah, this? Is no, not, not, not yet. As, 
Well, okay. we have make sure we didn't have anybody out there. Um, we have the yeah, we have the companies in the waiting room, and then I'll later ask if we have any uh, people from the town in the waiting room. Yeah, you know, it, my my two cents worth on this is, you know, I, I think we we're going to have to put together like what are what are our our expectations? What do we want this consultant to accomplish for us? Um, right. You know, if, if we can describe that properly, and Fred, we're probably going to need your help on that. Uh, you know, I think that's, in my mind, what we're trying to accomplish is to put something together that's going to help us control and maybe even eliminate some of these polls going up. So, uh, you know, I, that that would be a goal for me. And I think that's what our public is asking us to, to help them with as well. So if, uh, you know, I think we have to come up with if everybody else can throw in their two cents worth on what their expectations are. We can probably come up with, you know, who's going to be the best bed for us. Very good. Mr. Persinger. Well, I, I think that's part of what we want to hear from this company. You know, how, um, what should our ex expectations for success be based on the experience that they've had in working with other communities? Um, you know, is, is it reasonable that we'll be able to take down some existing polls? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I would like to hear from the, the companies what their, their thoughts are. Um, you know, what is it we think we can accomplish? And, and I don't think we know that right now. I know there are lots of things we'd like to be able to accomplish. We'd like to have all those polls just disappear magically <laughs> and waving the magic wand, but it's clearly not going to happen. And, you know, again, I would like to hear uh, more specifically from these companies what they think we could we can accomplish. All right, Mr. Kaczynski, you had your hand up. So from a technical point of view, I want to understand uh, what their capabilities are that we as a town could really lack to be able to direct that, for instance, co-location is feasible uh, in many cases where uh, providers are trying to look to put up their own dedicated pool. Uh, the second thing from a technical thing that I want to make sure that whoever we hire can do, <laughs> excuse me, is uh, regarding placement. Um, you know, we're, we in the town aren't really experts in how far polls have to be uh, to certain areas to get an effective signal. Uh, but I want our consultant to be effective in understanding that and being able to, you know, make decisions and help us make decisions in that regard. Um, the third thing, which I don't really know the consultants can help us, but they might be able to point us. And that's specifically things like, you know, environmental permitting where, you know, the, the recent issues that have come up with DENREC and placements there and, um, really trying to understand expertise around uh, what kind of environmental permitting uh, expertise might be needed regarding uh, uh, the beach lands for, for lack of a better word um, as those issues have come up. And I'm not sure these companies are really in that space at all. Uh, well, as, as mayor, I have the biggest thing that I would like to see if we're forced to have these polls, I'd like to see why would, they can't be put on route one even if we have to change our 35 foot height limit for poles, because we already have state poles that are there now that are much higher than our 35 foot height limit. So that wouldn't be any problem with me, but I, I, I was told by Verizon that it couldn't be done. The signal wouldn't reach the beach. And then I go to Fenwick Island and see them on the, on the highway and they're reaching the beach. So, I feel like uh, I've had the wool pulled over my eyes for sure by the company. Uh, so, so that's the question that I'd like to have, be able to, to affirm that we can have them on Highway 1. I'd like the advisory company to be able to do that. Any other questions or comments from the commissioner? I'd like to, if, if, unless the commissioners have a problem with it, I'd like to go to any public comment right now on this item before we, so that the companies know what they're going to be dealing with from us and from the public. So Ashley, do we have anybody from the public, not the companies, but from the public that want to make comment? Sure, it looks like um, Jeffrey Smith is in the waiting room. I right, bring Mr. Smith on, reminding we have three minutes. Hi, Mr. Smith, how are you, sir? Okay. Mr. Smith? Uh, yes, I'm good. Uh, did, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, definitely. All right. I, All right. Number one, I want to say how much I appreciate you uh, taking an interest in this item. It's been very helpful to, to the town and to everybody involved. We have three minutes here. We're giving comments. We just had commissioner comments. 
what the companies might expect from us and we'd like to have the uh, owners comment on what the companies might expect and then we're going to go to the companies and have them give a presentation go ahead you Perfect. have three minutes mr smith okay i'll keep it to three <laughs> uh we have we have uh looked at the permits that have been issued so far and uh, this morning, just uh, with one hour of work, we came up with these low-hanging but big pieces of fruit. Number one, wind speed calculations. 39 miles per hour on the beachfront won't fly, except for the equipment will fly. And that's what Verizon uh, calculates the wind speed. JMT, JMT, the one that you'll hear from, rubber stamp that on behalf of DOT. All right, that's number four. Now I'll work from the back. Tilson uh, asserts that fiber will be issued rooted to the poles. There's no fiber optics in Dewey Beach. I've checked a few times. There's no fiber optics. So that was a false representation. Um, number two, both permits in Houston and St. Louis were issued for pole insulation for property not on the Dell Dot right of way as we heard and has was well covered on the March 2nd hearing, uh, as well as reaffirmed on the March 22nd hearing, that and past the stub end of the street is that of either the town or Denrex, that can, that, that can be argued out by others, but it's certainly not a Del Dot uh, right of way. And Del Dot falsely claims that their right of way extends all the way to the Atlantic, but at the same time proposed on March 22nd that we uh, ex amend the 1983 agreement. Now, the 1983 agreement, which obviously didn't come up in anybody's searches, which is not surprising, frankly. Uh, I attribute that to our first mayor being a surfer. And he wanted to get his surfing poles <laughs> down to the beach. And it, maybe it wasn't indexed properly, but it's still a legal document. And we love it uh, because it's one of the ways you, Dewey Beach is unique. Number one issue is there was no location, co-location issued, either mentioned by a standard of JMT or by Del Dot. Now, on St. Louis, it's not 12 feet away from an existing pole. And I've sent you all a photo of the poles that are actually exist. Uh, it's a, a photo like this. I'm sure it won't, uh, can't project it like the other one, but this is on, I'll put it up on the website. On Rehoboth Avenue, uh, I'm sorry, on Silver Lake Drive and at that WPA bridge, as it's called, right the first entrance into Rehoboth. That's the pole. Actually, I could probably see from my house if on a good day. That has AT&T, Verizon, and a light pole. So I call it a triple play. We get one pole, one provider right now through JMT. That's unacceptable. So those are the uh, three reasons that the f uh, four, the fourth reason that, again, it, it now presents some serious liability to the town. Things are going to fly off 39 mile per hour. It's 40 miles per hour all the time there, as we know. And that's why it's a hard winter there. Uh, bless you all for doing it. Uh, but it is not going to fly. So my three minutes are up. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and the commissioners for all the hard work you, you're doing. I know that we're all on the same side on this and that's where we'll end up. And we certainly are all on the same side, Mr. Smith, and I appreciate that. And I understand you Absolutely. are also. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thank you. Ashley, we have two different companies on the line right now. I guess at first we want to hear from uh, JMT. I, I don't know if you know which which is which, but. We have Josh Johnson and Lenny Mazzotti from JMT. Mr. Mazzotti and Mr. Johnson, are you there? Yes, we are here. I'm looking to see if I can get my video up. Uh, Mr. Johnson, there you are. Mr. Mazzotti, there you are. 
Greetings. Welcome to us. We welcome to Dewey Beach. We appreciate you being online and 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 would like either one of you, Mr. Mr. Johnson, your mic is off, by the way. There yeah, we we're, go. we're in the same and, room. I just want to minimize the feedback. I'll unmute myself. Gotcha. No, problem. no problem. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Mr. Mayor. Which, whichever one of you here is which to start first and give a presentation and then you can rely on the other also. Sure. Uh, first, let me thank you guys for that warm, warm welcome we just received uh, to the call. Um, <laughs> I uh, wanted to first apologize that as a um, almost a Delawarean, I lived here for 40 some odd years and the uh, every spring I, I get a really bad case of the sneezes uh, when the pollen starts to flow. So forgive me as an almost Delawarean, she just won't let me forget that I'm not from here. So uh, um, if I don't get worry, a we're bit, all in the same boat. Here. Yeah, so most, most of us. I just forgive me if I get into a sneezing fit. It's that time of year. So I just want to get that out of the way first. Um, secondly, um, you know, I, I think what we were expecting to do was to answer questions today. And I apologize, Bill. I might have missed some instruction that this became kind of a presentation mode. So I do apologize. We, we don't have a canned presentation for this. We came prepared to answer questions. Um, we're from the, the Dover office of JMT. Um, I left Dell Dot to become a consultant in this field working for um, government was kind of my goal in regulation and helping to set up kind of some of the, the framework. Dell DOT um, brought me on board based on my extensive experience with their permitting programs. I helped them to kind of turn that process around in the mid 2010s, I guess it was. Um, I assisted Dell DOT with kind of remapping their permitting process. Um, I've had success helping with implementing ADA standards for the department. Um, and they brought me on board to help them kind of try to set up their wireless program. So uh, we've been kind of expanding that expertise. We've been involved since the legislation, well, before the legislation was passed in Delaware. Um, I can say that we've been proponents of changes along the way. Sometimes my clients are able to make the changes we recommend and it positions them better for the future. Sometimes they can't. Um, and that's across the board with our clients on 5G. What we find is that um, most folks aren't moving fast enough and so they're just falling behind with 5G. That's, that's the, the trend we see with most of our clients is that they just can't move fast enough to get ahead of it. What we try to bring, because we have clients across multiple states, multiple sizes, we're involved with, uh, I've spoken twice, three times, twice, at the, the National Ashto Convention regarding um, outdoor advertising, utilities, uh, roadside control. And this is a topic that I'm passionate about. 5G is, is a thorny issue. I, I can't pretend that it's not. Um, we constantly find ourselves challenged to help our clients stay in control of their own process. We see that as our primary directive in this matter, to help make sure that we give our clients the assistance they need through process and uh, content and um, policy to be able to kind of maintain control of their own processes. We frequently see um, situations which have the potential to jeopardize that level of control. We see situations where some of our clients hold to specific outcomes that they're adamant about, and sometimes it costs them um, in litigation. We try to work with our clients to find a path to a yes that they can uh, come forward and say, this is, um, this is the way in which we can see this happening in our jurisdiction. And we try to then be faithful to that vision where we can and to give feedback where we feel like it pushes them into the limits of what the FCC has already said the reasonable boundaries are. And we can't say we agree with the FCC, um, but we can say that we understand it because we've been tracking this since 2017. Um, and we've been involved with legislation in, in a couple different states, giving them feedback on you know, places we've urged uh, potential clients to say, please pay attention here, please push back here, please be aware that this is um, kind of a dead end path that you're marching down. Like we've give that kind of insight to our clients. They may or may not accept it. Um, in coming to Dewey, I, I think it's important to note that a lot of what we see playing out in the field, in this jurisdiction, in this state, is still largely 4G infill. There's some 5G going up, but it's not enough to constitute a full network. A lot of times it's just a token presence. Um, we've had, at, at one point, we had one carrier who had one deployment in the state claiming statewide coverage on their national advertising. Um, we see a lot of things playing out. It changes very quickly. We try to keep our clients uh, uh, apprised of what they can successfully and, and kind of um, amicably uh, resolve with the providers. 
but we also try to be just honest about what the limitations that we see are based on what we see playing out other places. Um, that's kind of what we came to do today was to kind of hear questions from the commission, try to speak to them if we can, and then point them back to our basic levels of service, which are, we try to make sure that our clients stay in control of their own process. We try to make sure there's a path to a yes, because that limits litigation. And where possible, we try to help to kind of come up with a pattern, which will allow you to recoup your, your costs where, where appropriate um, within the FCC's kind of framework and the court orders that have said, you're limited to a hundred bucks per permit unless they're actual reasonable costs. We've worked for the last three years to really bring the cost of this kind of service down because we recognize that smaller communities don't have an infinite budget. Um, so we've tried to kind of over time, bring that cost down as much as we can by streamlining our approach. Um, we believe that we offer a quality product that provides our customers with um, exceptional service. I think you could interview any of our customers with 5G and they'd share glowing rave, raving reviews about how they've been satisfied with our input insight. And generally, I think they, the only regret that we've heard expressed is that sometimes they weren't able to see the challenges we were trying to get them to see when we were pointing them out. Once they saw them, nine months later, 12 months later, then they come back to us and say, hey, by the way, what about that thing you talked about? So it feels like we're, we're profits more than engineers sometimes because we have to wait. We have to wait for our clients to tell us they're ready to hear what may be difficult sometimes or to act when it's urgent. And, and that's kind of, that's been the reality we've seen play out with this. Mr. And Mastotti, that, I'm going to make a comment first and then ask you a question to start the questions <laughs> off and then I'll go to the, go to the commissioners. Number one, this was not intended as an ambush of you in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> um, we, we were rushed to put an agenda up. We improperly, uh, not improperly, we misworded a part of the agenda as one company when we were actually talking about various companies or getting various companies. So that was not intent. That was not our intent. And number two, we know that you personally are not responsible, nor your company responsible for what the for our issues, and I'll say issues, not necessarily problems or, or qualms, but issues with the present providers. That's, that's neither here nor there, uh, uh, our issues with them, and we know you're not responsible for that. But the first question I'll ask as the commissioner and mayor, why can't we have poles down Highway 1 and, and instead of on the beachfront? Why? Why is it necessary to have them on the beachfront when, when I see uh, larger poles going up on Fenwick Island and they're evidently re reaching their beachfront without putting them up by the beach? Okay. So I, I'm limited in a couple of ways. So I need to be honest about that first. Okay. I don't have intimate knowledge of all the systems that have played out in every jurisdiction up and down this coast. So I can't give you specific answers, but I can give you my experience. You know, and, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here representing those other jurisdictions. So this is just, I, I, went, I took the time yesterday with uh, Josh. We went down, we rode through all the communities from, I think we, I think we skipped Lewis because Lewis is pretty adamant they're not ever going to have 5G. So we didn't go there because there's no 5G there. Um, but every other place where the providers have made a footprint, we went. We went from Rehoboth all the way down to the state line and back. And we looked at every community that we could get into that wasn't gated. And what we found was pretty consistent with our experience. While you may see the ones that are on Route 1, we're finding that there's also, by the same carrier, some that have been snuck in on side streets. So where you may see stretches where there's only one uh, Route 1 presence, our experience would tell us that this is not a complete be-all, end-all 5G deployment. This is kind of a first wave. What we saw play out over our experience has been there were periods where all we saw were 4G poles just 4G and nothing else. And that follows a much larger footprint, much greater spacing. Then we start to see some 5G where they're just kind of tucking it in on a, a hybrid where it's a 4G and a 5G. We start to see population of uh, private party poles. There's a, uh, is it in Fenwick Island where we found the, the, uh, the street light that had been added in the parking lot, which is something that local ordinances typically don't have a check for. So that's one of the deployment strategies we see is they're slipping this stuff in anywhere they can fit it. So there are some, they're not on route one. Some of them are lower, some of them are smaller, some of them are closer to the beach. But generally what we see from the providers who have made a significant push into 5G is a 600, 800 foot spacing. If they don't have it yet, it's mostly because in our experience, they haven't finished filing their permits 
or they're working on a private party uh, permit placement. Did you so, want to repeat that? You generally see 600 foot what? 600 to 800 foot grid from the providers that have made a significant showing. That's kind of the grid spacing we've been seeing. And as far as the being able to see the beach from the from the highway, for some carriers that may be possible. There's a couple different strategies that are being deployed by the various providers to try to achieve 5G. Some of it's really just hot 4G. That would be, in my personal opinion, from the experience I have with the stuff we've seen, that would be your best bet for somebody who could see the beach from Route 1, would be a carrier who's reliant on more the, the old 4G style technology with the larger waveform, the ability to kind of transmit that data without being easily blocked by things like leaves, low E glass, that kind of stuff. Where we see, where we see the, the stuff on Route 1, we see it as, as first wave. We don't see that as the end of 5G deployment in our experience. By by the specific company that put them up, you mean you don't just, see you see with, them you oh, see that you see that company putting up more poles within the same town. Based on our experience, that's what we see. And and in Fenwick Island, we found other poles that have been inserted other places to get closer to that spit that grid spacing we're used to seeing. Yeah, well, when I took a ride with our town manager, Mr. Zolper, down through and included Fenwick Island. Half of Fenwick Island, where the state streets were, they had them moved up close to the beach. Yep. And the half that was owned by the Fenwick Island itself was on the highway. And Fenwick Island told us they specifically requested that, and it was agreed to that that would cover the beach. Okay. I, again, I, I can't speak to every form of technology. I will say that's more consistent right. with what I consider 4G in terms of the, the technology that we're seeing for 5G. Those that are deploying kind of the shorter waveform 5G, they're going to be at closer spacing in our experience. If they've got somebody who can do it from that distance, it's because, in our opinion, it's because they're using a different technology than the ones you're seeing deployed in town right now in Dewey. And, and that would be the challenge, would be to try to see if you can, with your attorney's help, kind of figure out if you have the means to force technology, technology changes upon the providers. That's a legal question I, I don't have the answer for. There are technologies that operate differently. The ones that have been selected by the providers, some of them are not that flexible. And that's one of the challenges we see with these deployments is that unless your attorney is confident you can kind of control the technology, I can't really speak to what's possible because that's going to be, the, that's going to be the, the breaking point for that discussion, I think is the legal ramifications of saying you can't come here unless you do this specific technology. And that would be a legal okay, question. Okay, I'm, I'm going to remind everybody, the providers that are waiting online, the providers that are, Mr. Masadi are here with us now, and the commissioners that, again, we, this is not a, we're going to ask generally the same questions of everybody, and, and we're probably going to talk to other companies included, but we wanted to get this out in the public now. So. Uh, commissioners, do you have? Well, I have Mr. Bauer and then Mr. Jasinski and then Mr. Persinger. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but something you just mentioned there, Mr. Mazzotti, was uh, yeah, you said that Lewis will never have 5G. That was a jest. I, I've lived here far too long to, to be able to let a jab at Lewis go by. Sorry, that was because just a joke. we of uh, residents that would uh, follow yeah, that if uh, I, give choice. I, I apologize. That was purely in jest. I've, I've dealt with Lewis as a uh, as a citizen, as an engineer, as uh, building, like helping with uh, um, large scale houses and doing beam placements and things. And Lewis has just been an exceptional treat to work with over time. So um, we haven't seen the providers start there yet. They've gone where they think they can get a foothold. And if we're, if we're being honest, that's why Dewey is on the map right now, because the way things were set up, um, and this is something I've been clear about, um, you know, we, we see a lot of places that are much larger than Dewey that are not on their, their list, they're not on the menu. They're not. They're not going to every municipality up and down the state yet. They're focusing on Wilmington and the beaches. And within the beach communities, Dewey was kind of in a, an, unfortunate, an unfortunate mix of variables that made it an attractive place. And I think that I think those on the commission who kind of are familiar with the percentage of the streets that have DLDOT maintenance will understand exactly what I mean by that. It's just a perfect storm. And so Dewey landed on the map for reasons that have less to do with your appeal than your availability. And that was where most of our clients, we tell them, if you don't have an ordinance, you don't have a voice. And I think that played out here. Well, that's, you know, that saddens me, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the, I guess the reality of the situation. The, um, 
so my main question is, you know, not knowing the other towns, knowing what you know about us. Yeah. What kind of expertise do we need? What what sort of expectations should we be setting with people? So I think carriers and residents. I, I think the best that I have seen in terms of working relationships on this has been communities that are willing to reach out and say, look, we, we understand that this is important. We understand that there's something that is happening. We have some issues and we want to make sure that you understand what they are. I don't think that if, if you look back over you know, the history of the involvement of the providers with the town, I think it's, it's, there's been an attempt for there to be communication with the town. I know it hasn't been seamless, flawless, or productive maybe, but I think there's been an effort. What we find is when we engage providers in open dialogue about actual ordinances, we're, we're fairly effective in trying to move the ball in a direction that's helpful to our clients. I can't say we get everything for them, but that's what we, we attempt to do is to try to move the ball in the direction they're trying to move. Within the terms of expectations in Dewey, I think that there are some things that you may be able to take advantage of. I think some of it will require restructuring your current ordinance to be able to get there. I, I think in looking at what you guys have done, it's, it's a start, but I think it's going to leave you with some challenges. Um, I think there may be the opportunity to look at your co-location um, policy and try to give it a bit more uh, heft, if you will. I think right now it's, it's a low bar for most of the providers to be able to kind of step over right now, is my opinion. I think it would need some rework to try to make it more effective. Um, I think going back to something we heard early on to eliminate versus control, I think our expectation is control. Control is what we can help you to try to achieve. Um, it isn't the easiest thing to stay ahead of this. I think that what happened in Dewey with Tilson is an example of there are some really clever opportunities that come up and people are going to take advantage of them when they do. I think Tilson's one that the town should really be looking closely at in terms of the way your ordinance is currently drafted versus how you may want it to function. So I think that there are opportunities to be successful in certain ways. I think that success is going to have to be couched in terms of looking at the overall national picture. I think you, what you see is a lot of people very upset and struggling to find a way to be productive and expressing it across the nation. That's what I'm running into. That's what I see. People are frustrated and trying to figure out how to get ahead of this. Mr. Bauer, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Commissioner Jasinski. Um, so you, you mentioned something that uh, I wasn't aware of uh, in your uh, initial comments. And that was, you said a, a lot of these poles are 4G infill, um, but they're still small cell wireless. And I guess my question to you is, if some of these poles in our town are really 4G in purpose, even though they're small cell, do all the FCC rules still apply? I think to the extent that they currently present themselves as complying with federal requirements, yes. I think if you and your attorney are looking for what you can do to control this, you'd have to get into the details. I mean, it's, again, you look at the court cases that come across this, it is not a win-win-win situation for municipalities out there. Yeah, That's just the reality. Okay, and then the, uh, the next thing, I, I'd like you to dive into a little bit of detail on your firm's technical expertise around uh, enforcing co-location requirements, optimizing our requirements, evaluating when a, when a vendor or provider can co-locate, even though they say they can't. And uh, the same thing for distance and height, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, our mayor had mentioned, you know, Route 1. What, what is your firm's technical expertise on saying, well, wait a minute, you can put it, you can put this on Route 1. It doesn't have to go up the side street. It doesn't have to be this close to the beach. Um, just, just, just a second. I want to go back to your previous question real quick in mm -hmm. terms of the equipment the equipment all meets the definition of a small cell. And that's why it falls under the legislation. The FCC legislation and rules don't specify a G number, a three, three, four G, five G, six G. It's just in terms of a small cell. And so as long as it fits in the, it's basically volume requirements. Um, as long as it fits in those, it then right. is regulated under those rules. So, it, and it's tough to tell whether it's four G, five G, six G, you know, who knows, you know, their, their technology is closely guarded. So, okay. Um, thank you. But just wanted to clarify that. 
Mr. Jasinski, that solve your question? Well, we were we were on the te we were in kind of in the middle of the technical answer on uh, go ahead, location and distance. Yeah, so I would say um, m most of my clients have not really had the budget to really invest in exploring that level of fight, if I'm being honest. Okay. Most of my clients have kind of come to a conclusion that there are placements they can live with and they, there are ways they can try to work their standards to try to control some of this. But very few of my clients have really, when, when push came to shove and I, I got down to the brass tacks of what it would take to pursue this stuff, we have the capacity within our firm to, to chase this stuff. Very few of my clients are actually willing to take advantage of it. Okay, Maybe so well, let, me, let, me kinda, let me kinda clarify and then ask you a follow-up mm -hmm. question on that. So yeah. the residents in our town are pretty vocal that if it's technically possible, they want these on route one, not on the side streets. And if they go on the side streets, the residents are pretty clear that they don't want them at the beach entrances and they want them co-located on existing poles. Mm -hmm. So we don't in our town, none of us commissioners, none of the town employees are, are experts in this where we could have a, uh, a technical argument with a provider, right? right. Um, so if we are going to fight this and we're gonna use your, your team's expertise, what are we looking at cost-wise to do that? Okay, so um, in, in all of the circumstances that I can think of um we have worked through this process of the permit review to the point where we can kind of advertise our average costs for initial rounds of permits from providers in a new jurisdiction where we're just starting top out at around 1600 per permit and that's in the review phase once they get their legs under them understand the process understand what we require of them and are compliant it's important compliant we can get that cost down to about 600 per for the initial technical reviews. Okay. If we're doing inspections work, that adds another 600 to 1,000, depending on how many times we get called out in the rain, being told they're gonna deploy, only to find out they're not gonna deploy. So you know, that's kind of the rub is that it depends on what level of service you're asking for and how diligent the providers are in meeting what's required of them. Okay, and last question, I promise, uh, Mayor Cook. Um, we've run into the DENREC issue late, lately, which I'm sure you're you know, familiar with, I don't think we were necessarily anticipating permit requests coming on the beach side of, <laughs> of things for lack of a better word. Um, and d does your firm have any expertise, kind of more the uh, natural resource of environmental review aspects of this? And if you don't have the expertise in that, um, is there anywhere where you could kind of point, point us in a direction? Yeah, I, I, we actually do have um, an arm of JMT that deals with the environmental permitting side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I have kind of been communicating loosely with them. They work in some jurisdictions on the FCC required permitting for providers. So they have some insight into how that works, but that's in jurisdictions I don't typically interact with. So mm -hmm. um, we, could, we could look into bringing that expertise over. Um, it's something that has not come up to date because of the, the way that we're structured most of our jurisdictions are putting the onus on the applicant to require or to obtain all of these permits and then provide them. We haven't been actively engaged by any of our clients to pursue environmental permitting directly. We're mostly in the seat of just making sure whatever's required has been provided. And that's, okay. you know, in, in terms of that, it, it'd be unlikely that we would be engaged in doing environmental permitting for Dewey because it's the provider that would be ultimately responsible to obtain this. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Kuzinski? Yes. Mr. Persinger. Yeah, a few questions. Um, can you provide us with any specific examples um, where your efforts really have improved the position of communities and working with the vendors? Um, you know, either in you know locating or, or co-locating, you know, any um, you know, any way we can kind of judge the degree of success that you've had in working with some of the communities. Sure. I'll let Josh. Josh has had a couple of, of, of wins over the the last couple of years in terms of working with folks to try to move things when there was a, a, an ability to kind of leverage the situation. I think that's the biggest challenge we have is that in, in often, in oftentimes we're not, we're not, we're not getting the kind of influence early enough in processes to really be effective. And then we're kind of fighting the after the fact, right? But I think Josh can point to some of the successes we've had in terms of actually, you know, really getting what the client's trying to accomplish done. Yeah, so to that end, um, with Dell Dot, again, their, their perspective on this is more the safety of the traveling public, you know, vehicles moving from place to place through. And so putting things up on the side of the road is a danger, you know, vehicles go off the road if there's something off the road to hit it. Um, we, we've worked with some of the provider, 
uh, with one provider and they um, agreed to put in all breakaway based poles. So, you know, basically when it, it no longer becomes a hazard on the road, if a car hits it, it's intended to shear off and break away. And so that, you know, that was sort of a, we don't have to worry about a new pole creating a new hazard in these locations. As far as uh, locating, um, you know, again, it's, it's all in terms of what the, the requirements are, um, you know, as far as on what side of the road can we get it. If we've got poles on one side of the road, we've been able to, to steer the client, the, the client to make that a requirement, you know, so for you, we'd make that, you know, this is the requirement on where you have to go. And then working with the providers to say, no, you can't go on that other side. And we've had, we've seen some success on that. As far as co-location, um, a lot of that depends on the pole owner themselves, like who's the owner of the pole and what their, you know, the, the power companies are, are regulated by the NEC and the NESC and all of those things. So what they're allowed to do on a pole based on those requirements are sometimes tough. Um, we do know that um, from our experience, the pro providers are looking to co-locate where possible. For them to own infrastructure is a is, a, is an increased cost to them. So if they can be on those poles, they can. And in cases like um, we've seen in um, uh, Rehoboth on Rehoboth Avenue, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the two AT&T locations between First Street and the bandstand, they look very much like the decorative light poles. You know, so, so when you work with them, they do those things. And so these are all things that we would work together with you to find out what you're looking for as far as location placement, co-location requirements, coalesce all of those into this, you know, it's, it's what we say, sort of the path to the yes. Like we, we don't, if we say no outright to the providers, we run a risk of a foul, going afoul of what they call the effective prohibition, which is effectively prohibiting their service. And once you've gone afoul of that, they sue you. And when they win in court, they go wherever they want because they won on this effective prohibition language. So if we can put together um, reasons and logic that say, look, here's where you can go, again, within the, the confines of, you know, what the town wants. We don't, we don't want it in this area here. Can we go left? Can we go right? Can we go further back and up higher? You know, right now we have a 35 foot cap limit. Mayor Cook, you mentioned, you know, do we raise that cap on, on a pole height? If we can go up to 45 feet, do we then have some flexibility to go further back from the street? You know, you know, for example, if you were to go stand on the beach and look back at the streets, how far back can you actually see these poles? Like wh which poles can you see from the beach? And then, you know, and so, okay, if I go 10 feet taller than that pole, it can go, you know, if we're using straight triangle, right triangles, 10 feet further back. But again, you know, those are all things that we would work with you to find what your hard and fast, can't have this, but I can give you this to get that path to the yes, that is then amenable to the town, to the community, to the commissioners, and also allows the providers to provide their service. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you you have worked with with DelDoc in, in approving some of the the permits in Dewey Beach, I believe. Yes, sir. Um, that's correct. And, that's, and I'm assuming some of those poles are out out by the uh, the beach area. Um, what's your understanding of the the limits of the right of way on on Dewey streets? Does it extend beyond the end of the pavement? Is that Delta? I will, right away? I will I say that, that as presented, presented by our client, we provided input on the placement as being within right of way. Um, right of way is a challenge in Delaware. Unless you're willing to send out a surveyor, it's difficult to get the exact placement of right of way. We do have kind of generic placements which tell us which streets are under which uh, level of jurisdiction. But in terms of the specific setbacks and things like that, um, I, I think that a lot of this has to do with the best available information. And to the extent that it was shown to be within right away, they were approved for that basis. That's I think all we can really say about that. But that's basically based on uh, Dell dot information, I mean, information that you were provided by them. Uh, I yeah, I mean, again, we, we, we're co sometimes constrained by what our clients are aware of and what they are trying to accomplish. So when we, when we faithfully execute according to our clients' directives, that leaves loopholes for other things. As you guys have experienced, there's things that are happening in Dewey that are not happening other places. You guys are in a unique situation and you have some unique challenges because of that. And um, if, you were to, if you were to try to work with Dewey, if we were to work together 
what would the relationship then be with with Delta? Would you still be working with them as well, or it, it'd be unchanged? Um, in in this regard, because our directive is the same for both clients, it, we, we don't. This has not been deemed a conflict of interest. We are working with DelDot to meet their specific requirements and permits can be issued under their requirements. However, if we work with our clients, like we have uh, municipal clients that have DelDot jurisdiction like Wilmington. So what we do in Wilmington, for instance, is we do reviews against what Wilmington's requirements are and where there's any overlap. We actually have two separate teams. We have one that's municipal and one that's DOT. And so they run in parallel to review within the confines of the specific standards of each client. And then if there are elements which are in common, we often try to provide a, a discount to both clients because we're obviously not reviewing the same specific things twice. If there's overlap in that way, then we do try to reduce the cost for both clients because we think that's the appropriate thing to do. But in terms of conflict of interest, no, this doesn't represent one because our goals are to make sure that if DelDot issues a permit, we've granted them a recommendation that says it's in accordance with or it's not in accordance with your standards. Then they execute that approval. We would do the same thing in Dewey unless you guys empower us to act on your behalf. We would be making a recommendation to you that would say, hey, we believe you should grant this approval because it's in conformance with your standards. We believe that you can say no to this because it's not in conformance with your standards. And in that way, there's really no ability for this to be a conflict of interest from our perspective because we're going to faithfully execute each separate client's directives independently. Um, sure. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Bauer. Yeah, two, two quick questions. Just to confirm, you, you do currently and continually work with Delta, correct? We do. Um, and I think what you said to Commissioner Persinger is that you did advise Delta on how to, um, how to, to see through the Dewey permitting process, probably pre-ordinance on the aesthetics. I'm sorry, could you read the first part of that sentence? I'm not sure. Sure. So, so you, you assisted Delta in terms of advising them on what to do specifically within doing that? I mean, that's a, that's a challenging phrasing, right? I mean- I'm a challenging can, person. Yeah, we, we provide our clients with the insight we have and then they act on what they can act on. I really don't know that I can, in fairness, speak more than that. You know, we, we, make, we, make, our, we make our judgments on what can and should be permitted. We make that recommendation we might cite problems that we see coming up, but ultimately those are all kind of not something I can speak to here. No, I, I get that, sir. And Hold on. It, it's just, yeah, if, I can, if I can add something real quick. Sure, go ahead, Josh. The, 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 way, the way this started when, when DelDot brought us in, we sat down with DelDot and with all of them and said, what are your requirements? And, and they, we went through with, with the different sections of DelDot, traffic safety, um, pave and rehab, maintenance, and said, okay, what things can and can't you live with? So they, when I say we put together the checklist, really they put together the check. They gave us all these requirements and we coalesced them together. We then were, the permits were submitted. We reviewed them against those requirements and then said, based on everything that you've told us is acceptable or unacceptable in your right of way, this is what we have. In Dewey, you know, the, the end of the streets did come up in sort of like, hey, this is where this is located. We're not sure how right away plays here. And based on, again, based on their direction, we said, they said, yes, that would be within our permitting power. And so we said, okay, then based on, on your requirements of what you've told us are, we're, we're not putting together requirements. We're not putting together the, the, the rules and regulations. We're just looking at, at all the rules and regulations and bringing those two things in alignment and saying, and then and the same thing we would do again, our, with our municipal clients, it, we would assume it would follow very similarly here. We would look at the permit and we would tell Bill, hey, Bill, we've looked at this permit. It has of the 200 things that are required in Dewey, all 200 things are covered. Here's any like potential snags or, you know, we're not sure about how this play comes into play and pass it on, but, and, and we would make a recommendation to him, like based on this item, we think it should be denied or based on the fact that none of the items are flagging as incorrect, right. we think you need to approve that permit. So, yeah, it, it, this, isn't, this isn't on you guys. It's just, I, I've heard you say a few times that you know, Del Dot's primary purpose is, to, is for public safety and it's for repairs and maintenance. And I look at what they approved at these beachheads and say, this is not about streets no, no it's right. about a beach. So, this is not about public safety and it's frustrating for everybody in this town so to be frank 
we were brought into this by kind of a at the right place at the right time, right? My experience with Dot led them to believe that I was just crazy enough to help them get something stood up in less than a month because that's what they were facing. Yeah. This legislation was brought forward. It was not something Dot was soliciting. It was not something that Dot was trying to implement. It was something they were being told legislatively, this is now your responsibility. So when they brought me on, they said, look, we have to get this stood up. We don't know when the governor will actually sign it, but we need to be, and I, and I said, okay, well, here's my suggestion. You need to be stood up with a fully complete program with everything that everybody needs to apply for a permit before the governor signs it. And here's why. As I understand the federal regs, if somebody submits a blitz of 300 permits and you don't have everything lined up, they're going to take you to court and they're going to say, you effectively prohibited our services because you couldn't respond within the allotted 60 days. And we're going to ask the judge to give a deemed approved based on the fact you didn't act fast enough. That was the reality Dot was faced with. So we suggested things and we were sometimes successful. Dot suggested things to the legislators. Sometimes they're successful. Sometimes they weren't. Dot did not get out of that what they saw. There have been discussions, I think, at various levels on the provider side about how this didn't meet their expectations. They had the understanding that in Dell Dot right away, they'd have an unfettered single permitting system to work within. It was my insistence, it was my insistence, if I'm being frank, that we look closely at Delaware Code that brought up to discussion with Dell Dot the fact that there was dual permitting possible. That was something that I pitched to Dell Dot when I looked at the Delaware Code and I said, there's some challenges here, there's some loopholes here, there's some weak points here. We really should be trying to change some of this stuff. There's some language I don't think is exactly technically correct. And there's improvements need to be made, but at the point the providers had done what they wanted, what they they got what they think they wanted. Dell Dot had kind of been given something to enforce, and what I could observe was more than what I could fix. Yeah, I get so it. You're in a similar situation right now, right? I see that there are things you want to accomplish. I think some of them are going to be very challenging to get, but I think that we have the expertise to try to help you steer through this minefield, find that path to a yes keep you in the driver's seat. That's what we try to do for our clients. So Lenny, let me ask you one question based on what you and Josh both made a comment on. And it had to do with uh, Commissioner Jasinski's comment on co-location and the fact of who owned the poll. And for the public, I'm not suggesting we do this at all, just a hypothetical question, is that if we were to erect our own polls and is that something that you've seen in other jurisdictions that could then allow or almost force co-location? I'm going to toss, toss you to Josh, Josh for the answer on that. He's over here too for me. So yeah, go ahead. Okay. I would remind the commissioner, just one, we, we have a timing issue, so we want to move forward here. Go ahead. Okay. My last Josh. question, Mr. Mayor. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll answer real quickly. It's something that we've suggested in, in various locations. Um, we've suggested it to Delta. We've suggested it to uh, Newark, New Jersey. In, in that ex the very thing you're trying to accomplish here is we don't know that it's it, that it will and or will not be effective, but it's far harder to say I need my own poll when there's one 10 feet to the right that is sp specifically designed for these things. Like there's a poll there, why can't you co-locate on it? We've seen things where the providers are able to move polls uh, and I, I don't have an exact number, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, you know, okay, you know, can we move it here? Can we move it there? Like they have, they have, spots they're trying to get to but it's not a we have to be within this three foot ring in order to do what we're looking for sometimes it's 10 feet 20 feet again i don't i don't know what all of them are different but um so that is something that we that we've suggested in various capacities either you know opening up your infrastructure to co-location i know dewey doesn't have have doesn't have the infrastructure but like set, telling delta like hey if we don't want more poles why don't we make it easier for them to get on our polls? And the same thing with in other municipalities, like if you make your stuff easier to get on, it's harder for them to say, well, I couldn't do that. And you're like, well, why not? It's like, well, because it, it wasn't my poll. Okay. The, the other real opportunity that I think, again, this is tipping my hand as a consultant, but to get this one for free. How about that? Um, you know, if, if there was an attempt to underground in sensitive areas, like at street stubs that face the ocean, if you're undergrounded, you can try to pull in a stealthing requirement. If you have above ground utilities, you have a much, much harder, harder path to try to control what the outcomes are going to be. But these are big steps. They're expensive. These are not things that most of my clients can really, they don't have the juice to do. 
you know, undergrounding large sections of most cities is just not practical. If you guys had the wherewithal to underground at the beach stub ends and you had an ordinance that prohibited sensitive areas from being um, populated with new poles that aren't stealth technology, I mean, you might be able to get more of what you're after. But again, that's, that's going to come at a cost. And quite frankly, I don't know that you guys have the budgetary means to do some of the stuff that, that would make some of what you want as accessible as your, as your constituency are really seeking. Thank you, Mr. McKnight. Mr. Stevens, does that answer your question? I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Bauer, the last one, and then I'm going to have a comment myself. Okay. Um, Josh, you brought up a, a term that I hadn't heard before about effective prohibition. So I was doing a little research while we were talking here, and I found New York's definition of it. I haven't been able to find Delaware's definition of what effective prohibition would be, because it would be a state, not a federal uh, lawsuit that would be filed against us. Are you saying it's a federal definition? What, what, whatever it is, I'd just like to have a copy of it so, I, you know, so we know what we're dealing with. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the effective prohibition that I'm talking about would be something that comes into play in the FCC dockets and orders related to 5G deployment. Um, mm -hmm. And it talks about the, co the com competition between vendors, correct? No, no. This is something else. Let me let me see. I think I have I it can, pulled up. I can, I can, I was say, I can share some, some of it from rhetoric it. while Josh. I'd just like to get specifics. a copy of it. That's all. Yeah, that's fine. we can provide yeah, that. It's, yeah, I, I can I can yeah I can find what I have. It's an it's an FCC thing that basically says if you make a requirement that effectively prohibits service, that they can sue you. So it's it's, it's not a state level right. thing. This comes from the FCC, but I can definitely forward that. Um, I've got bill of yeah, I think emails. The approach other municipalities have done is is taken to a state level. But anyhow, uh, that, that's question one. But if I get a copy of that, that would be helpful. And you know, it just really sounds like well, what we already know. It looks like we've been taken advantage of here by carriers. So I think that's an opinion shared by many. You know, it, it, you know, just call it what it is. I mean, they've taken advantage of us, and uh, you know, I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not of the uh, uh, demeanor that you know when you have people that abuse you, people, why do you want to cooperate with them? You know, it's like you mentioned Lewis earlier. Uh, you know, what, I mean, do we have to turn into a Lewis to just be uncooperative with everybody? Is this? Is this I cannot count you on that. That'd be for Fred. Fred, I'll throw that one to you. Fred, I'll uh, I'll leave that in your capable hands. But is is there any legislation that could be done at this point or is that is the horse already left the barn and there's nothing left to be done? I mean, I, I think it's a little bit disheartening to see how avidly supportive the FCC has been of this. Right. And, and the court mm -hmm. cases that have come out about this all revolve around the fact that you, the municipality, are not getting the level of control over what's essentially a zoning matter that you want. Like that's what right. the heart of most of these lawsuits is. And unfortunately, in my experience, what we see playing out at the national level, these lawsuits don't end in the municipalities winning back their full autonomy. So the only thing I can counsel any of my clients or potential clients to do is to move quickly in a direction with a plan and then execute that plan. That's the best defense I can give anybody. We try, we try and we try to make sure that we stay ahead of this as best we can because we want our clients to be well-informed. We want them to be able to prepare right. themselves for what they can do and then what they need to figure out how to work around to get what they want done. Thank you, Mr. Mastani. Does that answer your question, Mr. Bauer? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I just, just, Mr. Mastani, I'd like to very quickly, if you can, and I, I apologize saying very quickly even, but we own the light poles in the middle of the highway of Highway 1 going down through Dewey. Why, what's the possibility? Why can't we in that section of Dewey uh, in, in effect require that, uh, that they be placed on the light poles or that the light poles be replaced with compatible equipment? Okay, so this is gonna be something Fred will need to do some research on to give you guys an answer that's specific to your jurisdiction, okay? Because from my perspective, the, the carriers right now are behaving as though they have the freedom to pick their own technology. I've not had a lot of experience where I have clients who are willing to push that issue to the mat and go to the mat over whether or not the jurisdiction has the, the ability to require a different technology. So for, for instance, uni uni universal deployment is not exactly what we see, but it's pretty close. Whatever a company has picked to do, that's what they do. That's what they do everywhere they go. We don't see 
in the jurisdictions we're working in, a lot of variety. We tend to see first wave 4G, we tend to see first wave 5G, sometimes we see a hybrid, but we don't see a lot of variation. There will be, 6G will come, 7G will come. We believe that those things will change the profile of what you see on the pole, maybe it'll be less obtrusive, but over time, we believe that you're going to see this technology kind of morph and evolve and change. Right now, at this moment, I am not sure if you have the, the ability to require the provider to go on a specific pole at a specific place and use a specific technology to do that. That's a legal question. The, the, the flip answer to that is if you make it so attractive to go on that pole that they can't help but try and figure that out into their strategy, then you might have more success. And I don't know all the, the workings of that and how you would do that, but you know, if the, you know, I'm just going to make up things here. So please don't quote me on any of this or, or hold me to it. But, you know, the town will pay for the replacement pole. The town will deal with X element. We'll, we'll figure out how to get you power to this location. We'll pay for the power. Again, just, just, just throwing out ideas here off the top of my head. You make it so attractive that they can't help but go, maybe I can get one there. And maybe I can tweak my network such that those poles are part of it. Um, would be a strategy that, again, would be, something we could help you talk through and figure out like, where's the, you know, again, I don't know how much electricity these things use. So I don't know how much of a commitment to an electric, you know, are these things burning a million dollars electricity a year? Yeah, we probably don't want to commit to that. But, you know, those would be things that you could, you could evaluate and you could, you could work through, you know, are there other municipal buildings, a municipal flagpole perhaps that you could say, hey, let's replace the flagpole. And then again, they would evaluate that within their network and potentially make that as an option. Mr. So. Johnson, Mr. Masati, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time. Unfortunately, we have to move on to the next group. So thank you, Ashley, if you could switch lines here for us, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you for thank your you time. Yep, thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. Ashley, if you could bring in CTC net. I remember their name. Sean Thompson and Karen White. Mr. Thompson and Ms. White. Mr. Thompson, how are you, sir? Mr. Thompson? Mr. Thompson and Ms. White, yes, how sir. are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Whichever one of you yeah. wants to start first and, and sort of give us an introduction to the company and, and your thoughts so far. Sure, I can do that. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Zulfer, for, for the conversations that we've had and the standard for, for setting us up with the, um, with the Zoom call. Um, so just a quick introduction about CTC. Um, CTC is a woman-owned company um, based out of Kansas, Maryland. Um, been around since the, um, I guess, the 80s. Um, doing wireless communications, wired communications. Um, we're a consulting firm in the telecom space. Um, we support governments. Um, we're completely vendor neutral. All of our, um, our dealings are uh, supporting governments. Um, we work with IT departments, public safety, municipal utilities, public works, um, runs the gamut. Um, we work with states, local agencies, as I mentioned, municipal utilities. Um, we help with all their broadband needs, essentially, um, from wired communications to wireless communications, and specifically um, with uh, the concerns that um, Dewey Beach has right now. Um, Sean Thompson is our VP of Analytics. He's also our wireless manager um, for a team. Um, that uh, handles our wireless attachment work. And you guys um, hopefully received our um, credentials in a document that I sent to Mr. Zolper. Um, so you've got some background there and seen all of the communities and uh, governments that we've worked with. Um, so we've, we've worked on technical standards, policies, ordinances. Um, Sean runs a, um, a, a team that handles permits. Um, so we're familiar with all of the the ins and outs and the um, challenges um, for the permitting process, um, dealing with the public as well as um, with the providers. We've got relationships with the providers as well. Um, 
Personally, I, I, I'm recently managed and Sean um, supported me uh, working with the Texas Department of Transportation, setting up their ordinances, doing a gap analysis for small cell placement um, and working very closely with industry to make sure that they were a part of the decisions um, that made it a win-win comparable uh, situation. Um, and also working, the state working with municipalities. Um, you know, we understand that uh, that uh, Del Dot um, is the one doing the permitting here within the town um, and that you guys are working on that agreement between Del Dot and the town to um, kind of transfer the power and the responsibility over to the town for, for these um, attachments and poles. Um, so with that, um, I will hand it over to Sean who will um, introduce his department and um, how, uh, how we're already working with several um, municipalities across the country, um, including some um, of those along the beach. So we understand um, the specific issues that you guys have um, so, Sean, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks, Karen. Um, as Karen mentioned, I oversee our wireless group. Um, our group does uh, various types of wireless work. Um, one component of that is uh, handling wireless siting for several different jurisdictions where we will, um, in a, on a turnkey basis, uh, accept applications for wireless siting. We will process it. We will get it to a point where it's um, accurate. Um, we will uh, interface with the applicant if information needs to be submitted in order to res resolve any kind of deficiencies uh, and ultimately provide a recommendation to the jurisdiction. And we do that for uh, eight or nine different jurisdictions. Um, uh, in addition to that daily processing, uh, we also have consulted with many cities, states, and counties, uh, putting in a process to do just that. And in some cases, the local jurisdiction will have some type of process in place already. And so the question is, you know, how do we get uh, from where we are to where we, we'd like to be? Um, in some cases, this would be uh, helping them install something from absolute scratch. Um, and so we really, um, understand, I think, you know, from, from all kinds of phases about uh, how to move something forward. Um, typically, when this needs to be addressed, it's because there's quite a bit of pressure from the industry. Um, and so we have experience of, of moving quickly as well. Um, as I'd mentioned, we've worked with many different um, states and, and cities. Um, I was, you know, just kind of thinking about, you know, in what circumstances have we worked with um, other localities that may be in a, in a, in a similar situation. Um, but one of our uh, clients is Worcester County, where Ocean City is. We worked with them when broadband planning, which included looking at wireless, et cetera. Um, and we had several other um, coastal clients, Bulghead Island, North Carolina. Um, but some of the others, you know, I think that from an aesthetic viewpoint or, you know, how do we get this deployed, but do it in a way that is not obnoxious. Uh, we've worked with Anne Arundel County, Maryland and their waterfront um, area. Um, recently, we've collaborated with Seattle, Washington, where they had this, like, I don't know how the size of this project must be, you know, millions and millions of dollars of reconstruction of their waterfront where they put in all new pedestrian walkways, restaurants, et cetera. And they were faced with a similar problem is there's few poles. The poles we have, we don't really want you to use. Um, and if we are forced to um, um, make them of use, we need to find a way that, um, that they're hidden as much as possible. Um, vandalism comes into play. You know, the more places you, you get these in accessible areas, um, et cetera. So we have, I think, a lot of uh, directly relevant experience um, that, that I think can come into play to help to uh, work with you all. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I'm going to, I'm going to have a question myself first, and then I'm going to move on to Mr. Persker had his hand up first. Who else would like to ask questions? 
Well, Mr. Jasinski after that. So, um, Ms. White and Mr. Thompson, I appreciate you coming. Believe me, um, we're, we're kind of, we're a small town with a small budget and we're worried that we're gonna be snowed under. And, uh, and I know these providers have budgets, you know, uh, a million times larger than ours and they have no qualms about going to court. So what would be your advice for most small towns like us and where have you, you know, had to deal with a small town like us, hopefully in Delaware, where we have the same problem? And then I'll have one more question. Uh, well, first of all, um, we are um, quite used to working across the table from these service providers. Um, we know what we're talking about. We're not going to be snowed, and we'd be sitting on your side of the table, uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we maybe should have mentioned is that we all of our work is completely independent of any industry, um, so we don't take any work from any of the service providers. Um, and um, as I as I mentioned, we'd be squarely on your side. Um, we've worked with several, many um, small. Uh, jurisdictions, the, the lessons learned that we've brought from other small jurisdictions, but also the biggest ones, we would, we would bring that to bear to, to help you all. Thank you. Uh, and and I'll, I'll add to that is, um, I mean, the experience that we have with um, actually doing, reviewing the permits and going to bat for, for the government's um, per permit um, that experience is invaluable um, because we've gone, you know, Sean's team has gone all the way down deep and um, also um, attended public meetings as well to represent the government and support the government's in responses to the public um, and from industry. industry. Uh, the only other question I have, a lot of other commissioners, we've got to get to them because they're a lot more eloquent and understand the problem more than I do. But uh, we own the polls the light poles in the middle of the highway uh, uh, that goes through the center of our town. Um, what would be your comments on, on or thoughts about requiring that they uh, move their equipment or have their equipment, uh, these providers have their equipment on those light poles and, uh, and the, with the possibility of replacing the light poles and who, who might be charged that, might the, might the providers be, have that cost involved in putting up their equipment and co-location, et cetera? Uh, well, let's say that this is the most preferable location, you know, so if they're going to go somewhere, let's, let's have them go there. Right. Um, and so my suggestion would be to uh, have, you know, in a set of rules, we would say that um, if you want to go anywhere else, you must first demonstrate why it is, impossible for you to locate your equipment in this location. Uh, we would provide the uh, review and determine whether we buy their explanation or not. And if they simply can't get over that hurdle, then, you know, they could decide not to deploy or they could come back to this poll. Uh, but we have seen in most cases uh, where the, um, the polls are owned by the municipality, city, et cetera, um, that they would require them to replace it. So first you would say you need to go there before going somewhere else, A. B, uh, you would replace that at your own cost because we're unsure of the structural integrity of that pole. Um, and C, you may also have some requirements about the pole itself. So uh, if you were going to retain ownership um, or if you wanted to um, retain responsibility for maintenance of the light itself, et cetera, those would be negotiated too we'd be able to help you on, on each of those decision points. Thank you very much. I believe it was Mr. Persinger who had his hand up. Uh, I did. Uh, thank you for coming today, first of all. Um, I'm just gonna focus my, my questions on, on just one area. I, I noted in your um, set of capabilities that you provided to us for today, uh, that you had developed a program, uh, comprehensive wireless siting process for Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and that interests me because my permanent residence is in Montgomery County. Um, uh, it was also apparently recognized as exemplary um, by the National Association of Counties and uh, 
also recognized as providing notable best practices by an FCC uh, advisory committee. So uh, if you could give us a little insight into that, first of all, uh, and maybe characterize for us what constitutes best practices in, in this case. And then I know that Montgomery County was also involved in some litigation uh, related to their process. And I, I thought it was related to aesthetic standards, uh, which I believe was all, also ultimately unsuccessful. And if you could tell us a little bit about that as well, uh, I think that would be helpful. Okay, great. Um, I, I myself am a resident of uh, Montgomery County. Um, and our team uh, does uh, process their applications um, as they come in and we provide a recommendation um, and, and that's part of their process. Um, I should say that uh, this is a, an evolving field, uh, which means that even things that we found innovative and put in place uh, years ago are uh, being you know, rethought today. Um, and, and that continues. So as a, for instance, there are um, zoning changes, amendments, um, procedural changes that are being um, thought about. Uh, our uh, firm is um, involved with those discussions um, and, um, and, and we would you know, continue to provide advice. Um, Montgomery County has a lot of active citizens. Um, um, they are very interested in where these are being installed what do they look like? Um, a lot of comments we get are about the RF exposure of these sites and the impacts thereof. Um, a lot of the things that Montgomery County has done is really put something in place that uh, balances the, the public's participation and um, you know, desire for awareness, et cetera. Uh, so for instance, when an application is made, same dis business day, this is uh, posted online and available to them. Um, uh, we, when we receive an application, believe it or not, 90% um, of the applications that we receive, uh, we flag as being incomplete. Um, and we'll flag things that I think maybe other people wouldn't flag as being incomplete, but if we find an inconsistency, uh, for instance, when their structural drawings, they show an antenna at, you know, 50 feet and in their application, someone writes, you know, 47 feet, we'll flag that and say, this is incomplete because you haven't given us what this height is. I don't know what it is, right? 90% of the applications we flag and say, you know, this is going back to the applicant. You need to get it right. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, that can happen a few iterations to get it fully accurate. This is brought before a committee that's made up of the county landowners. This would be like the uh, Montgomery County Pub or the public school system, their, their water company, um, parks, et cetera. Uh, we present the case to them, they, they vote, and, and ultimately that would go on to be permitted if it's permitted use. That's the process in a nutshell. Um, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, an ongoing thing and there's, there's new innovations um, in the works also. Thank you. Can you comment on their litigation? Uh, yeah, uh, the litigation that I'm aware of is that um, the, the county took issue with the fact that the last time uh, the FCC had uh, published uh, any updates about the RF emissions was in 1997, I believe. Um, and they are simultaneously placing um, um, limitations on the on communities really everywhere uh, about uh, being able to uh, eject, object to citing or deny applications. And meanwhile, uh, they're using new technologies and new frequencies, uh, but this hasn't been updated in, since 1997. Uh, their point of view is that this makes no sense that these are being forced upon the community, um, yet we're unclear on the health impacts of these newer frequencies. Uh, so their lawsuit was asking the FCC to uh, go back and um, essentially provide an update to these emissions. Um, this, I think that they, they, they dropped that um, after an unsuccessful uh, attempt. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Is that it, Mr. Persinger? Yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you. Mr. Janiski, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, di I did. Um, 
I, I just want to know, do you have any kind of general high level recommendations about what a town like Dewey Beach who's in our situation where a lot of poles have been permitted that had we have had uh, kind of control of the rights away at the time the permits were done, what you would put in place at this time to try to help us going forward that are kind of things that are unique to this town in our situation? Yeah. First, um, any new site that goes up is puts you in a bad spot. Um, one of the one of the downsides to a site going in is that that site is likely now categorized as an eligible facility structure, an eligible yeah, facility structure. And what that means is that there was a lawfully placed wireless facility there, and that's going to make it difficult uh, to stop any type of changes to that site in the future. And what that means really is that uh, you're right to be alarmed that those uh, went in. Um, I think one of the maybe first things that we can just be totally sure of, maybe you have already, is that those were completely legal. And if they're not, uh, then we may have some grand, uh, some room to at least remove that classification. The next thing you can do, though, is, well, make it more difficult for them to put things where you don't want them. Um, and we have seen this do, you know, so the federal government would say you need to make your right away available. Um, the response, I think the best practice is that we say, okay, but we are going to have a, um, a preferred location list. And if you wanted to place something on a lesser preferred location, uh, you need to demonstrate why it is impossible to, to uh, locate on a, on a um, structure that is more preferable. Uh, and we would be able to um, analyze uh, their response and and um, and uh, counter it if if it's not you know doesn't fully explain their position. Thank you, Mr. Kaczynski. Is that it? Yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Any other commissioners have questions? Uh, I I do. I'm gonna. Oh, Mr. Zoper, you had your hand up. Go ahead, sir. Uh, since no other commissioners do. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Ms. White and Mr. Thompson, thank you. Can you discuss, and you just hit on a little bit, the RF, the eyes, electronic magnetic energy coming off the top of some of these poles, and what's your experience about how far they should be away from a, a residence um, based on the experience with insulations in the different locations across the country? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think to a large extent, um, the city would probably do well to make sure that they're able to um, have a policy in place that you feel is adequate to uh, a make sure that there are no persons in an area where they exceed the limits that the FCC has put in place, and so you need to have some way to evaluate uh, whether whether you know they can get to an area that is accessible or not. Um, you know, the fact that there are sites that are near the beach makes me think that maybe there's places that are near dunes too. Um, these antennas are typically highly directional, which means that they, they kind of shoot out sideways. They don't necessarily shoot down at the ground. Uh, and that's why in a lot of cases they say these are below the limit is that, um, you know, it kind of goes out and by the time you know, you're in that ray, the signal has gone down. But if they're located like near a balcony, if they're located near a sand dune, uh, these then this becomes, you know, really um, a concern. And, uh, you know, we would be able to do the calculation ourselves, you know, either it's above the limit or not. Um, the other piece of it is not just this technical, you know, um, you know, demonstration of whether they're above or below the limit, but it's how you are interacting with the public and how the public uh, can feel assured that the, the city is making sure that they are also below the limit. Um, and so there, there is, um, the, you know, this would be, you know, what type of documentation are you requesting at the time of the application? How are they demonstrating that, et cetera? Mr. Zolper, is that all? That, that does. So we have an example of a pole that's on New Orleans Street and State Route 1. It looks like it's a 5G pole. It's about 12 feet from a, 
a second floor. I, I believe it's a bedroom. So for me, I'm asking for the NIER report from Verizon, and I haven't gotten that yet. So now I'm going to ask for, for that report from DelDot because um, we don't control where they put that poll in, but still they're in our town, and I feel we owe that to the folks that are in that residence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other commissioner have any other questions? Any other, Mr. Townsend, do you have any questions? Actually, yes. Um, I'm sure that this is not a cookie cutter approach that, um, that you can apply to each permit application, but can you give us an estimate or some kind of um, guidance on what it might typically cost to, to do a permit uh, evaluation? Yeah, typically we'll put uh, applications in a couple of different buckets. So we'll say, you know, this is a minor modification or, you know, it's a new poll. Um, we would, you know, I, I'm not sure to what degree your ordinance is, um, you know, you're considering it, updating it, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, a, a lot of times when we really, when we write the ordinance, when we're considering the ordinance, it's not just about, you know, these are the rules, but it's, um, you're, you're really attempting to modify their behavior. You want them to place it where you want it to place it. You want them to act the way that you'd like to. Um, and, and, and so by having different categories of applications, you can, um, you can, first of all, have different fees, but usually those fees aren't there just to try to modify their behavior. We found that really doesn't work. Um, it's really the hoops that they need to jump through. Um, for each application type. So it's just simply harder to place a new poll than it is to make, you know, swap out an antenna, for instance. Uh, all that being said, um, we, our uh, fees average a little under $1,000 for minor modifications and for new polls up to 3,000. But these are highly customizable, as you mentioned. Um, in, in fact, in some states, they have, uh, you know, uh, really, significant restrictions on what can be charged. And so, you know, we, we can modify the review process uh, in order to capture, you know, the, the most important things, so to speak. Um, uh, but we do have a, what we think is a very well run um, process, meaning you, we, can, we can cover everything pretty much under, um, under those fees uh, with the exception of if you're, you wanna go all the way to court or something like that. Mm -hmm. and and a quick follow-up question, um, in, in an effort to go where you're, you'd like to go, do you typically deny a permit application and offer to consult on new sites? Um, because we've got the 60 day shot clock that's running. Um, and uh, how does that typically work? If so this is a, a different question if you were processing this on your own uh, or if you were to have us do this for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to do it for you within 10 days, we would be able to uh, do a complete review of the application. Uh, we would identify any of the, um, you know, the um, items that are um, problematic. In other words, they're just not accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, we would also be able to identify alternative locations, we'd be able to examine the alternative locations. Within those 10 days, we would be able to give a response back and say, you know, we, we note that you're requesting to go here, but we find these other two poles to be in a more preferable location. And, you know, we want to know why you're not able to, to you know, go on those poles instead. Um, if you are going to do this on your own, this would take some work. Uh, the, you know, sh the shot clock is difficult for almost everyone. There's some jurisdictions that are just like, we don't even, you know, we, we can't make it. So, that, you know, they just acknowledge it, right? Um, we're streamlined to do it. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that's the only thing I can say is we will be able to help you if you want to take that on uh, and, and we can do it for you if you'd like. Mr. Townsend, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I, I'm trying to go to commissioners first. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Stevens, then Mr. Then Mr. Didi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you, had, you, made, you just made a comment that sparked something in the back of my head, and that is that the town of Dewey Beach is currently considering the possibility of, uh, right now it's a dual process, right? One 
starts at Del Dot and then secondarily comes to us. So there's two different shot clocks uh, in that situation. We're considering having sole responsibility. Do you find that the two shot clock or the two uh, having two people approving the permit is more advantageous to the to the town of Dewey Beach versus having the one? And just get your thought process on it because I realize that a there's an element of the shot clock. And having now, because we're in March Madness, it's fun to say that. Um, but also, you know, from a control perspective, you know, we do have an ordinance on aesthetics. So I just like to get your opinion on that possible change that we have internal to our organization. Yeah. I can tell you that running two separate parallel processes is uh, is challenging, however you, you do it. If you want to, um, first of all, the shot clock from, I think, the federal point of view is that any anything any part of that, whether it's state or or city, um, is going to be part of the same shot clock. So if you do these sequentially, um, this is going to have its challenges just to fit that inside. Uh, we we've seen we I know that we've we've seen examples of municipality municipalities inside of counties that are, have this question. We also see this with like cities inside states. Um, we have advised in certain circumstances that uh, the, um, for instance, the city could identify the items that are not addressed within the state and they take on those issues. Um, and then the state take on, you know, the, 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 the remaining. Um, if there is overlap, um, the industry is likely going to complain uh, both about shot clock fees and process. Um, although, you know, it is what it is from my perspective there. Um, so you're, you're, in the end, you, you really dealt with uh, making this all work within the shot clock and then keeping this as least confusing for everyone as, as possible. Um, you, if you're able to address everything under one permit, I, I would think that you'd want that simpler approach. Mr. Stevens, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you, Mr. Cook. I'll go to Mr. Didis and then Mr. Bauer. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question regarding uh, the app. And uh, when a uh, communication wireless company comes in, what is typically the range for a 5G uh, wireless uh, connection? It's a tough question. And uh, unfortunately, I have to say it depends. Um, there's a lot of marketing around this word 5G. Um, and I'll tell you that I think for most people when they hear 5G, they think super fast, you know, this is what 5G is. Um, and in that context, uh, that's that flavor of 5G requires a very, very high frequency. Um, and those high frequencies have a very short range, but not all carriers are actually using that. Um, so we have to just be careful about what their claims are. Um, when they are using this very high frequency, it's called millimeter wave. Um, you know, this can be limited to 800 feet, something like this, really short. Um, however, a lot of times they're saying 5G and it's really even 4G, or if it's 5G, it's not this high frequency 5G. In those cases, you're talking about thousands of feet or even miles. So um, it really depends, unfortunately. And the follow-up question to that, well, first of all, we've been told 250 to 500 feet by one of our providers. So, and we don't know how to challenge that. We've heard that seems to be about the right range, but we don't know enough about it internally to dispute that. And secondly, when the technology changes, and uh, have you run into the experience of them removing poles and, and bringing them further away from a beach end, or has that happened as of yet? For example, if they say the new technology that may come out has a range of you know, 5,000 or 10,000 feet, uh, what do we do with these poles that are at the beach ends or be, that potentially may be uh, placed at the beach end? It's a problem. I, I, I think it's a problem for a lot of different, you know, that site's gonna age, even if they stay there, it's not gonna look prettier. Uh, they're gonna make modifications to it. Um, and, um, you know, in the event of abandonment, maybe that's, you know, the best case, right? You're able to get rid of it. 
Um, but in all likelihood, uh, that site's going to be there for a while. Uh, it's in an ideal position in order to reach probably a lot of people. And, um, you know, and, and that's the reason I, I think that if there are places that you'd like them to avoid, it's, it's important that this be put on the very bottom of the preference list and you make it, you know, just as hard as it, it can be to get there to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Bauer, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, yeah, just real briefly. Thank you very much for, for both your time here. Uh, you've given us some really good insight on successful ways you've been able to do this in other places. Who are your clients in Delaware? We have worked with uh, Del Dot, although not for anything on siting. Um, we've not ever done anything on wireless siting other than helping them, I think, with some wireless deployments of their own, like public safety. But Karen, do you, would you be able to be in a better position to answer that? Sure. So for Del Dot, um, we, we kind of have two projects going on. One has, to, they're both for the transportation management operations, Gene Donaldson. Um, and so one of the projects is the, um, the broadcast towers for traffic information. Um, so we do the siting for those and those are very tall towers um, on Del Dot right of way or, or Del Dot property. Um, and then we also work on their um, traffic, uh, the, 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 the traffic um, light uh, information and other ITS intelligent transportation system information. So getting that from the source back into their network. So a lot of that is, is done wirelessly, but um, using different frequencies, different, um, different components, and those will hang off of uh, Dell dot structures that they own already. So those are the-, the Some of those, does 5G interfere with those signals, traffic signals, et cetera? Um, with the information coming from there, um, they're usually they're using 4.9 um, megahertz, and the 5 5G, as, as Sean was mentioning, um, they're either up in the higher they're uh, around 4.9. I think they're either higher or lower, um, yeah. which is what the providers are using. How about electrical poles? Is there an interference signal level that? they can lay claim that they can't uh, co-locate on a utility pole because of electricity? Is it no, I mean, I think that the they, yeah, would, go ahead, yeah, they would view electricity as, a, as an advantage, you know, so that they can power their equipment. Um, the, the frequency management for the most part as set up by the FCC does a pretty good job of mitigating interference issues. So we're not seeing, you know, I, I would recommend every municipality make sure that, you know, within your ordinance, you say that, look, you know, if you don't cause any interference uh, with any of the systems, and if you do, you know, take it down within 24 hours or whatever, but really that doesn't, practically that doesn't happen um, only in like really odd malfunctioning situations. Right. Well, I'm I'm gonna... Gonna... Sorry, Dale, go ahead. Mr. Bauer, I apologize, I just wanted to, interrupt you and tell you, we've been told by the providers that they can't put their right. equipment That's what I wanted on, to ask. on an existing pole where there are electrical wires or, or uh, I want to say generators, but not generators. It's, uh, yeah. So I, I think that what you, there's two things that could come in play. Um, first is that there are rules written by the NEC, and there could be rules written by the power company itself that says uh, you need to be a certain distance from their conductors. And usually that's like 48 inches or more. And so they would need to be either up above or below that. Um, in addition to that, the, the structure owner is the power company in this case. And the power company may have uh, certain rules about which of its poles uh, are, are good candidates for this. And they may say um, poles with transformers, poles that have, you know, this or that, you know, aren't, we don't want those used. So it's true that they may have, um, uh, you know, out of the whole universe of poles, only a subset of those may be, you know, uh, mutually agreeable to, to deploy their equipment on. Mr. Bauer, I just didn't know. I just didn't know if you knew that we'd been. Yeah, told. I was aware of that. Uh, 
So we have a lot of telephone poles on all our, we have, I don't, we may have more telephone poles per houses than any other town in, in, in the country, but, uh, but none of them want to reattach to those poles. And we keep hearing that all they want is a new pole. And, um, you know, so it sounds like, like a telephone signal. I mean, I, there's not that many people using telephones these days, right? Everything's a wireless phone, but, uh, you know, all these telephone poles are, you know, we could, they're really, you know, nothing else is going on on those things, which I found it surprising, but I don't have the knowledge or background to right. advise on that. Can you specifically speak to that? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one strategy, this is a simple one, is that the, those are owned by someone. And if you were to contact that entity, if it's the telephone company, power company or whatever, yeah, Verizon, then they are like, they would likely have a, like two, it's like a two page document of um, uh, uh, a list of things that kind of uh, prohibit the use of wireless deployment, right? And so if, if they're going to make the claim, I can't use this poll because the provider won't let me, then we had better be able to identify on that two pages, the item, you know, that, that disqualifies it. Um, if it's not on there, then, you know, we're not, we're not buying it. You know, right. there's no reason for you not to go here. Well, you know, like in this case, this would be Verizon telling Verizon, it's not going to work on my poll. Uh, well, show me. I mean, so th this is our, you know, so th this would be, this is our policy. Is this, we have is this, this document. So of expertise, I guess, is, you know, because we're going to, you know, if we're going to hire someone, this is where I think we have a, uh, you know, some, you know, some, some good uh, uh, leeway of which we can reduce the number of these polls and eliminate hopefully some of them because we're putting another poll right next to polls that we already have. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Bauer, yeah. does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions by anybody, whether it be commissioner or employees or hearing none, Mr. Thompson and Ms. White, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. We appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more item on the agenda. Well, could we, Mr. Oh, Mayor? Yes, we, go right ahead, Mr. Brewster. I just, we we're finished with uh, with this particular issue. Is that right? We're finished with talking we're to finished with, I'm sorry? We're finished with talking with any companies interested. OK. Uh, um, I just want to put forward a, an idea, a suggestion uh, in terms of how we would fund the services that would be provided by these telecommunication um, consultants. Um, you know, I, we do have a substantial budget surplus, I believe, for the end of this year, which ends tomorrow, I guess it is. Um, and we talked a little bit about a way to reserve some of those funds to pay for this kind of service. Um, and I could offer a motion now, but if it's not appropriate, I could, I could certainly do it at the beginning right. of April, because um, it's kind of a distinction without a difference. Uh, all of that uh, budget surplus money uh, stays in the general fund. And the idea would be to create a new assigned fund balance within our general fund, which we would call um, broadband infrastructure, uh, in order to have some money that's set aside to cover these, uh, these kinds of services. It, it, it wouldn't commit us to actually spending the money uh, it just makes the money available and it provides a specific purpose. It gets recognized in our accounting system and uh, our auditors would be fully comfortable with, with this, this sort of approach. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about a, a ballpark of somewhere around $20,000. I would suggest that you know we take about $40,000, put it into this assigned fund balance. Again, it's not spending money. It's not calling for you know, a new bank account. It is something, it's just a designated categorization uh, within our general fund that would provide us with uh, some resources to, to use to address this issue. So if it's, I, I saw some heads on it. It sounded like it's not appropriate to offer a motion now. Uh, and I can, I can certainly do that in April. But I just wanted to get that on the table to get people thinking about it. Thank you, Mr. Persinger. Mr. Stevens, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um Gary, why wouldn't you just want this to be part of the infrastructure fund as it is? Uh, the, the infrastructure fund has- my, my, only, my only hesitancy, I don't like creating all these little funds because then we'll come back in three years and try to get rid of them. Well, I mean, we, we certainly can get rid of it. You just have to vote. It, it would be an assigned fund balance. 
The infrastructure fund is, is a committed account. It, it's a different categorization. Uh, also, I think this kind of uh, work and services would not fit into our definition of infrastructure. Uh, so if we set this up specifically as and title it broadband infrastructure, make it an assigned fund balance within our general fund. You know, again, it shows up in our accounting system. It gives, them, gives us some resources, but I don't think it adds any complexity to our overall you know, accounting That's process. Fair. That's fair. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Stevens? It does. It does. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Any other hands up or questions about this item or suggestions about this item? Then I suggest we move on to the next item then. Item number three, discuss and possibly vote to extend the term during which restaurants and eateries may expand table service premises with administrative approval through March 2022 as authorized by state law. Mr. Bauer, where'd you, Mr. Bauer, are you there? We've lost him. Should we give him a minute? Yes, let's try that. Nope. Mr. Mr. Townsend, go ahead. I could lead off if that's okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So when the uh, original authorization uh, was made uh, to allow for municipalities to authorize the extension of premises to these restaurants, um, it was done through a um, through the governor's state of emergency, one of the iterations of the governor's state of emergency. But subsequent to our authorization of the town manager to evaluate these applications, the General Assembly has taken this notion and made it state law. So it's no longer in the, in the governor's state of emergency. And we're trying to be faithful, particularly Mr. Bauer's trying to be faithful to uh, what, uh, since I mentioned Mr. Bauer, Mr. since I'm mentioning him, I, I wanted to wait to see him connected. But Mr. Bauer particularly is being, wants to be faithful to the wording of the motion that we passed earlier, which tied our ability to allow for an extension of premises to the governor's state of emergency. Well, now the provision has been both extended, but also moved to state law. So the, the notion here is that it would be appropriate for you to both authorize the extension and to make a simple motion to refer to state law rather than the governor's state of emergency. Well, Mr. Bauer. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Uh, so I guess this is last March uh, when we first started, uh, there was a state of emergency and you know, things were, things were closing down and, uh, you know, we, there was an opportunity that businesses could start take out and, uh, and it also expand into, you know, into their parking lots, et cetera. So we wrote an ordinance tied to the, not an ordinance, but we approved the expansion of premises based on uh, the state of emergency, the term state of emergency. And then I believe in May, May 22nd or so, uh, uh, the governor's 19th modification came came about and and then it be, you know there was a state law that passed at that time that extended everything through March 31st which is tomorrow uh, where businesses were allowed to uh, expand in their premises so now that was house bill 349 so now house bill 1 uh, replaces where house bill 349 was previously and what that does is uh, extends it to uh, another 12 months. So what I wanted to do is just be consistent with what the state law was that the uh, uh, that they had passed. So uh, that's why we have this before us now. I look at you know what we did last year was really a good thing for for a lot of people. One it one it was good for the town. Uh, it was good for the businesses. It was good for the visitors that came in. And it was also good for the residences, uh, residents that are here. So, you know, when overall, I, I don't think we had any issues uh, with the expansion of premises. So this is really just extending what we already have in place today, but making it consistent with, with the state law and attaching it to House Bill 1, which the governor just signed uh, five days ago, I believe. So we didn't really have an opportunity to sit on this for a long time. That's why we, we got this in here now. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bauer, I, I have a suggestion. Uh, if we were to
take the previous motion that was made back then on the, it was uh, May the 22nd. Mm -hmm. We would take the previous motion and it was made, it says in accordance with phase one of Delaware's economic reopening under the governor's regulation and just change it to in accordance with HB1 of Delaware. I wouldn't be considered HB1, it'd be considered Delaware law. And then the, right. the, to well, substitute the governor, that, that urgency is one thing. House bill is where it goes through the House and then the Senate, and then it goes to the governor for signature. Typical yeah. problem. Right. We can't say HB1, but we could say we could quote the number of the law, the regulation. Right. And, and just substitute it for, for what we had in the last motion. That would be fine, wouldn't it? Right. I, I think so. I mean, so we're, what we're doing is attaching our, our uh, expansion of premises directly with what the House and the Senate had passed and the governor exactly. signed. Exactly. Mr. Townsend, would, you have, would, would that work for us? Yeah, so I think the reference would be to amended Title IV of the Delaware Code relating to alcoholic liquors. All right, and then I'm suggesting that we possibly do that to cut to the quick here, because I think yeah. everybody wants to. But Mr. Persinger, you had your hand up. Well, it's just a question, um, because HP1 does deal just with establishments that serve alcohol. And I don't know if there's um, any other business in town that is just an eatery and therefore does not serve alcohol. Um, so would the governor's declaration be relevant to a uh, eatery that does not serve alcohol would not be therefore covered by HB1? Well, may I? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, Mr. Count. So I think the, the reason the governor's um, initial state of emergency addressed it in Title IV and because state law is addressing it in Title IV is that's where their jurisdiction is. Otherwise, these are zoning matters. So um, they, they are thus in the, our, our realm. So I think, I think in practice, if there's an eatery that doesn't sell alcohol that makes an, a, an otherwise appropriate request to expand their premises, that they would, be, they would at least get consideration for doing it irrespective of whether they're selling alcohol. So right. um, this you wouldn't may, allow wanna, you may want your motion to acknowledge that it's not specific that the expansion premises are not meant to be specific to alcohol serving establishments. Okay. Well, Mr. Townsend, I, I thought what was being said was that the governor's order, the original governor's order would specifically to eateries or restaurants rather that serve alcohol. Was that true? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not sure that it was. I, I'm. I'm responding to Mr. Persinger's correct comment, which is that the subject of House Bill 1 is the alcoholic liquors chapter and, and nothing else. Right. So, or sales okay. of alcoholic beverages. All right. Thank you, sir. I just need that clarification. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion on the floor? And I would suggest that if we just took the previous motion and substituted for the where it says the government regulation substituted the the Del, new Delaware law, Mr. Townsend said that we could put that in it and that would cover it. That would be the exact same thing we have in effect now. Right. I'm, I'd like the motion out if I could, and we can still go ahead, this. Mr. Bauer. All right, Fred, I'm going to need your help, your help on this. So motion to approve the expansion of premises consistent with HB1, so, House Bill 1? Yeah, so I, I think what we're doing is we're, um, the motion would be to authorize the town manager um, to field applications for extensions of premises uh, of both alcohol serving establishments and non-alcohol serving establishments in the town of Dewey Beach in accordance with the um, provisions of Title IV of the Delaware Code. Um, okay. And then note that that this period is, is being extended to March what, 2022? March 30th, 2020. March. Right. Um, Ashley, do you have that wording? I got about half of that in there. I was trying to write as fast as I could, Fred. I think so. I, I, can I have the May 22nd wording. Ashley, do you, 
Mr. Bauer, do you want to know the, your present wording or the May 22nd wording? Well, I'd like I the motion exactly like Fred just said it. Um, <laughs> motion by Commissioner Bauer to authorize the town manager to, be, to field applications for expansion of premises of both alcoholic and non-alcoholic establishments in the town of Dewey Beach in accordance of provisions of Title IV of the Delaware Code. This is being extended through March 31st, 2022. Uh, now that I'm gonna call for discussions, but I'm gonna have some questions here for, just and maybe Mr. I, Townsend can answer. Huh? I just wanna make sure- Is there a second? Up, did I get that correct as it when I read it back? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashley, I appreciate that. Uh, is there a second for that motion? Hey, I just have second. a quick one. Fred, does it, it, we don't need to mention HB1 or no? Well, HB1 is what amended Title IV. So Title IV right. is, uh, is addressing at, that for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stevens, you second the motion. I second the motion. All right. Now I'm going to ask Mr. Com Commissioner Bauer and then Mr. Stevens to speak because they have made the motion and make her the motion in the second. And then I'd like to say something and then I'd like to go to Mr. Person to add his name and Mr. Jasinski who had their hands up. Mr. Bauer, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think it's motioned and it's been discussed. I mean, it was wildly uh, popular last year. I'd like to keep it going and let's keep bringing people to town. Let's get them all back here and keep people outside, not spreading germs around. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Mr. Steven. Yeah, I, I believe that it's in, the, in the, the town's best interest in terms of the restaurants and established here to continue for another year of having the, the ability of how to seating to allow more people to get vaccinated, to get to keep people outside and to grow herd immunity. So that's why I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, I'm gonna to go to my question first of, of Mr. Bauer and Mr. Townsend. Mr. Bauer, was this, is it your intent to include in that motion the limits that were placed on it in the motion originally from May 22nd, which included shall be on restaurant property only, not on town property, no outdoor music, no increased seating capacity, and all expanded space, spaces to be closed by 11 p.m.? Yes, that is my intention. Okay. Mr. Mr. Townsend, would that, the way it's worded, would that cover all those limitations? Yeah, th th this is, again, this is a simple motion um, authorizing the town manager under very extraordinary circumstances. So we're not treating this like we would if it was an ordinance, um, referring it to the planning commission. Um, so I, I apologize to interrupt, but will that cover all those limitations? Will yeah, the, the, this motion is meant to extend the current policy um, okay. to the new date. All right, thank you very much. As long as I got to have that on record. Mr. Persinger. I, I, I do not believe that it is specific enough. I believe those restrictions should be a part of the motion. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's clear at all that it's extending the current policy. And so I, I have to disagree with the town attorney on that in that respect. Are you asking for a comment from the I would attorney? Like to see those conditions. Yeah. You'd like what? I would just say I would like to see those conditions added to the um, uh, added to the motion. And they're basically uh, from a section of our code that all restaurants that have outdoor seating have to abide by. Uh, I, they're not all quite consistent. If, if we were going to change it at all, I would probably refer to the specific section of our code where the conditions um, are, are listed that restaurants that have outdoor seating areas must abide by. Um, but I, you know, I, I would not be in favor of this without those conditions. Uh, are you asking for a comment from our attorney? Or are you asking for the maker of the motion to amend the motion or are you just making a comment? Well, it sounded like uh, Commissioner Bauer intended to include those conditions mm -hmm. as part of his motion. So I would not see a problem with adding that into the formal statement of the motion, if, if that's the case. Mr. Bauer, Mr. Persinger is asking you to amend the motion. I have no issue with that. You know, I just want to be cautious that if House Bill 1 approved takeout, that doesn't preclude them from, you know, we're not trying to overstep state law where they're allowed to have takeout at 11 o'clock or 1130. Well, that it just says so, 
closing the expanded spaces at 11.30. Right. Closes the expanded spaces, but that's where the takeout normally happens at. That's the point where the transaction happens at. That doesn't happen. You can't walk out of an establishment with alcohol. You have to get it outside. That's part of this law. Just be careful. I mean, I, my intention is to keep it just as we had it last year. If I need uh, to add to it. Mr. Persinger, Mr. Persinger, I guess has asked that you amend your amend your motion to include on restaurant property, not on town property, no outdoor music, no increased seating capacity, and all expanded spaces to be closed by 11 p.m. And you're, the one question you have is about the expanded space and take out yeah, I, I, is, I, I would agree to all that, and we can add, I'll amend my motion to include that. Uh, but Fred, do we need a sentence in there as, as so long as we don't uh, overstep the, what the state law is? I don't think that we do. Okay. All right. And let's let it go just like that. I'll amend then, my motion. Then, to include then you those amend your motion to, for those four items. Correct. All right. And Mr. Jasinski, you had your hand up? You need a second on the amendment. I'm sorry, you're absolutely correct, Mr. Stevens. Do you second the amended motion? I do second the amendment. I just wanted to make sure that David had his voice. I understand. Yeah. I have his name written down. Thank you for the reminder, though. <laughs> Mr. Jasinski, now your comment. I'm calling the vote. <laughs> I, vote. I agree. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any against say nay. Any abstentions? Ashley, it's unanimous. All right. Now go to the next item, town manager comment. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll be real, real quick on this. A lot of things going on. Meet with Del Dot tomorrow to discuss the crosswalks at Chesapeake, Swede Street, and Rodney Street. Also meeting with Del Dot to discuss the sand on the end of New Orleans Street and possibly having that removed. The lifeguard station has been painted. The floors in the police department have been replaced. They've also gotten new chairs up at the dispatch area. Um, discovered a number of different electrical issues over at the annex that are safety concerns. We are having that addressed by Apple Electric, if you see that uh, going on. Recruitment for the lifeguards and the summer police officers are going very well as of right now, and they're continuing to move forward. The new tractor should be dropped off tomorrow. The new phone system's being installed. The T2 uh, parking, um, new system that you approve is being worked through by uh, by Merle over there and the code enforcement. And if you notice the water underneath the water tower over on Bayard Avenue and Clayton Street, that water is continuously running. It's going into the ditch in front, which Denrac has approved. It's a county work project that's going to go on for at least three more weeks. It's running down to our pumps at the end of Bayard, which are running about every eight minutes. I've asked Don to go ahead and do... Um, uh, an electrical comparison for this week to the same time period last year, and the county's agreed to work with us on that to get some um, reimbursement. Also, I pointed out to uh, Mr. Dede's today about our pumps continuing to run. That's something else we will uh, deal with with the county if one of them. Mr. Dolper, can you speak up a little bit? What's up? Thank you. That's all right. I was asking you to speak up a little bit. You were turning away from the mic. I, well, I heard it. Uh, thank you, okay. Mr. Goldberg. Uh, Commissioner, excuse me, Commissioner Bauer, your comments? Yes, yeah, just a real quick one. Uh, looks like our new dune mats came in, correct, Ashley? So uh, I guess we'll be getting those out and, and uh, extending the lengths that we had now. Uh, we can thank. Uh, uh, for our CTF funds on that, Senator Lopez had approved those uh, for us. So uh, a, a nice thank you for uh, to Mr. Le or Senator Lopez for uh, approving those. And uh, we'll get them out there and get this place ready for summer. I didn't even know we had a new commissioner, Mr. Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Jasinski. Uh, no comments. Commissioner Persinger. No comments. Commissioner Stevens. No comment. Mayor Cook, no comment. I'll call for a motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. So moved.